Network. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. And now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. All right. We are back. This is Fade to Black. Today is Wednesday, January 22nd, 2014. You can do the math. We are 22 days into the new year. As always, we are live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here in Burbank, California. I am your host, Jimmy Church. For KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network, a big salute to all of the proud men and women in uniform all around the world that are fighting the good fight for us. Without them, there is no me, there is no you, there is no us, and you can't hear me right now. Think about that for a second. Let's get this show cracking. We've got a big one. This is, the show's been about three weeks in the the making. Before we kick it off, happy birthday to Linda Blair. That's right. Where did the time go? 55 years old today. Steve Perry from Journey is 65 years old. How do you feel right now? And Sam Cook, who died in 1964, would have been 83 years old today. His hits, all the great ones, You Send Me, A Change Is Gonna Come, Cupid, Chain Gang. Sam Cook would have been 83 today. One of my idols. Follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. We monitor everything throughout the show. You know that. Facebook, JimmyChurchRadio.com. YouTube is KJCR Fade to Black. Go like, subscribe, friend. Do whatever you'd like to do. Email me throughout the show. As always, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com is what you do. We use non-NSA specially encrypted servers, so you can do all of that in confidence. The producers here at the studio here in Burbank shoot me all of the good emails. I will read them on the air. Tonight we're giving away a bunch of stuff, by the way. I'll get to that later. Um, I've got some autograph books and I've got some really cool DVDs that uh, uh, we we will be giving away later on in the show, too, as well. Uh, The bumper music tonight, as always, is Doug Aldridge from Whitesnake. Thanks to Doug for that. I'll be seeing Doug this weekend at the NAMM show. Oh, last night. I went to the UPARS meeting here uh, where uh, Nadine Lalich uh, gave a, a, a really cool talk last night about underground military bases and, and her stuff. She was on the show Friday, but to see her do it uh, live in front of a packed house, a couple of hundred people um, out in Sherman Oaks last night. And thank you for everybody that came out that w- listened to the show and came out to uh, it was great meeting everybody last night. I had a great time posted a couple of pictures today all right also on the website uh, go check out the uh Karahunge story on stan's blog there are some pictures right now of Karahunge who put put up a gallery if you've never heard of Karahunge, go check out stan's blog at jimmychurchradio.com it is quite possibly the oldest megalithic structure on planet earth well now it's in competition with its neighbor there in Turkey, uh, Gobekli Go Tepe. But uh, go check out Karahunj. It is the Armenian Stonehenge, and it's probably three, four, five thousand 5,000 years older than Stonehenge. And uh, so go check that out. All right, the new forums page. Uh, thank you for everybody participating in that. It's uh, turning out to be the Paranormal Ghost Hunters page, but uh, go check that out. There's some really cool EVPs that are posted. And over, uh, I'm going to jump in uh, as I do after the show tonight. I'll jump in on the forums. And I went around over the last few days and invited a bunch of uh, uh, paranormal groups, ghost hunting groups, uh, to listen to the show tonight and check out the forum and jump in there. So to all of you that are listening around the country that I spoke to this week, uh, welcome to the program. All right. Um, Now, I'm going to uh, jump to a commercial because when we come back, this is something that we've been putting together here for a couple of weeks. And if you 
listen to the show, you know what the effort has been going in to, uh, to get this done. So I want to go ahead and jump to a commercial now. I want to get to this show right now. Okay, we are going to run for the next hour commercial free. So let's go ahead and do it. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. You know what to do on Twitter. You know what to do on Facebook. Participate in this show. In the second and third hours tonight, I will try to get to all of your calls. We'll be giving away some really cool stuff. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. When we come back, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, stay with us. Don't touch that mouse. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I gotta tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444 one 5444 or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S.com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. This is KJCR at jimmychurchradio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. KJCR, this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Now, everybody that listens to this show, you know I've always promised the brightest, the most international. And in a few minutes, that's exactly what we're going to do. Over at uh, ArtBell.com, there's something that you guys got to check out. That's right, we have a video of an invisible UFO. <laughs> Uh, also, there's a really cool article I read today. It's called The Five Strangest Paranormal Military Projects. And you know how I am. I talk about that stuff all the time. And I read that article today. Go check that out. It is really cool. Um, and I posted at uh, on, the, on the Jimmy Church Radio fan page uh, a story today, if you didn't catch it, about the supernova that's lighting up the sky right now. And uh, so go over and check that out. Uh, we will get the links up uh, for it. Uh, it was breaking news today. We'll get that up on the website, too, as well. But the pictures are absolutely fascinating. And I'm guessing that in the next day or two, you're going to be able to see it with your, with your eyes. Right now, they're saying a pretty good telescope. Um, uh, um, what's the word that I want to use? Just uh, an amateur telescope. Binoculars right now can actually see this. And it is amazing. So uh, if you haven't checked it out, go over to uh, the Jimmy Church Radio fan page on Facebook and uh, check out that link, and we'll get it up on the website. Um, so, okay, you know what? That's it. I'm done talking. I'm, I'm very excited about uh, our next guest, and I always, always promise things like this. And we have been working uh, on, on this show now for about three weeks, and uh, so now, tonight, we're finally going to pull this off. So let's just get straight to it. Dr. Jeff Meldrum is a professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University. His interest in cryptozoology, in particular the legendary Sasquatch, 
happened when he stumbled upon a set of footprints himself. He has researched throughout the Pacific Northwest, the Rocky Mountains, and has traveled to China, India, and Siberia. And I'm going to talk to him specifically about Siberia tonight. Meldrum received his B.S. from Brigham Young University in 1982, his M.S. at BYU in 1984, and a Ph.D. in anatomical sciences with an emphasis in biological anthropology from the State University of New York at Stony Brook in 1989. He held the position of postdoctoral visiting assistant professor at Duke University Medical Center from 1989 to 1991. He worked at Northwestern University's Department of Cell, Molecular, and Structural Biology in 1993 before joining the faculty of Idaho State University, where he currently teaches. I am honored. I am welcoming to the show Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. Jeffrey, are you with us? I am. It's a <laughs> pleasure to be here, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, like, you know, and the thing is, uh, Dr. Meldrum, and from now on, it's going to be Jeff, if you don't mind. Is that is that okay? Absolutely fine. Because after that bio, I've got to give my, you know, my mouth a, a chance to relax. That is, uh, it's about as impressive as it gets. But uh, we, we received so much email about you when we announced the show a couple of weeks ago. We don't need to talk about last week. That's not where I'm going with this. But there are so many. When I, The reason why uh, this entire thing came up was because a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a show on the Bridgewater Triangle, which you and I were talking about earlier today. And in that show, uh, Bigfoot came up about a, a lot of the anomalies that are going on there and a lot of the strange events in, 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 Bridge, in the Bridgewater area. Bigfoot. And I just, just in passing, said, well, you know, if there's one thing I'm a skeptic about, not really a skeptic, but I'm, I'm a skeptic, is Bigfoot. And, man, did that open up a can of worms. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, and it's not that um, I'm a skeptic, but I am. Okay, so uh, last week, and I got all this email, and you've got to, you know, you've got to talk to Jeffrey Meldrum, and, and he'll set you straight. And, you know, <laughs> and it, was, it was one email after another. And, and I'm so glad that uh, you picked up the phone and said, Jimmy... And I told you to tell everybody, I said, I'm a skeptic. And you said, let's go. <laughs> Skepticism's good. I mean, it's, uh, it's important to have uh, a, a critical objective, uh, you know, a mindset that you don't just accept everything uh, on, on its face. Right. It's when, when you pound that skepticism key to the exclusion of, of any open mindedness to the possibilities that it becomes a detriment and an obstacle to, uh, to new knowledge and new discoveries. Well, uh, before we get into my skepticism, because uh, when um, uh, I, I say that, but I kind of underline it a little bit with 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 quotes around it, because sure. um, the Patterson film, which we're going to talk about a lot tonight, is the one thing that I feel that all of the Bigfoot Sasquatchies out there have in their corner. So it's not like... You know what I mean? So we're get, well, let's get back to that. But uh, I want to uh, – I have to ask you a couple of uh, uh, questions that are just on the front of my brain, which, okay. is, which is this. How, how do you deal with your coworkers? <laughs> you know, and, and I don't know if – maybe you know where I'm going. I mean, you have to walk into a room, and either they're going, oh, man, here comes the Bigfoot guy. Yeah. You know, do you feel that pressure? Is it, is, is it something that you can touch? Is it there? And how do you deal with it? And Or do you deal with it? Well, yes. Yes, I do deal with it. And, and it is there. And it is sometimes it is very palpable. For one thing, I try to uh, avoid being pigeonholed as simply the Bigfoot guy. I'm, I'm uh, you know, a, a very uh, dedicated uh, teacher, instructor here on campus. Um, I think my students uh, have a really great experience in the courses they take with me. I am, am actively researching uh, my principal area of, of expertise, which is hominid bipedalism, and I'm involved with lots of other projects. Sometimes, uh, you know, I'm balancing 
<clears throat> different uh, plates on different dowels at different times. And, and of late, I've been spending a lot of time trying to uh, get the uh, Relic Hominoid Inquiry, the online journal that I edit now, get that up and going and get some inertia behind that. But the reaction from my colleagues is, um, is, spans the spectrum from uh, enthusiastic interest and support to what I can only describe as visceral rejection. And, uh, and uh, I mean, there, there, <laughs> there certainly are people who would just assume that I withered up and, and, and blew away and disappeared off the face of the earth. But there are lots and lots of people who, who are very, very supportive. And, you know, sometimes it feels like a lonely position. Sometimes I feel like that lone voice in the wilderness uh, within the scientific community. But, but what people don't realize is there, there are lots of colleagues, some that are visible, like Dr. John Bindernagel, for example, or, or a colleague that I work with very closely, John Mayanzinski, um, who is a wildlife consultant. Um, recently, I began collaborating with uh, Jim Halfpenny, Dr. Jim Halfpenny, who's mm-hmm. a, an mm-hmm. expert tracker. But there's a lot of things to go on behind the scenes, too, that people are usually not aware of, where I'm interacting with people acting as, as uh, reviewers or commentators on, on papers that I'm editing for the journal and uh, others involved in, uh, in the various projects that I have my hands in. It has anybody, well, I think you just uh, uh, alluded uh, to this right there, but have, have they ever come up to you and just like whispered in your ear? You know, uh, hey, man, you know, I'm with you, but let's keep it on the down low. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that, that's happened. And, and, and the a- absolute opposite has happened. One, one of my <laughs> most vocal critics is an instructor in the physics department here on campus. And it's kind of a running joke because he writes a, a column, an interesting column on the in our Sunday paper here locally. Uh, has He has opinions on a lot of different things. <laughs> But one uh, column that he ran was basically entitled Bigfoot and the Easter Bunny. And so in the physics department to this day, there is one of those uh, Sasquatch lawn ornaments that you see in the Sky Mall catalog. Yes, yes, yes. Standing in the physics department office holding an Easter basket full of plastic Easter eggs. Hey, that's not right. That's not. <laughs> oh, I think it's funny. But, I mean, but it's you just, know what? Uh, but there's you know, a there, the, you know there's an element of truth to that too as well. You kind of have to uh, respect their their opinion on that. Yeah. Abs- well, you know, uh, I almost and out of respect, I didn't. But I almost put, you know, tonight, uh, Doctor Jeffrey Melbourne is going to convince Jimmy Church that there's a Bigfoot and a Santa Claus. You know, but well, there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> you know what? That, and, and but I just don't know how um, because I I walk around and and I talk to you know my friends and family and everything about you know what I they they're all interested uh, about this show sure. and 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 I am serious about how I feel about things. I'm very I'm very uh, uh, I, I I won't bend. Okay, so but for you, you're in a different position. I'm an enter- I'm an entertainer. Okay, I'm not a uh, an educated uh, college professor that is putting it all on the line. And I just I, honestly, I don't know how you deal with it because you know there's only one of you or two or maybe three in the entire country, and there's a whole lot of others. <laughs> you know, so I just don't know how you deal with it. Well, it's just. It's such a fascinating subject, and I have seen so much persuasive and compelling evidence to this day. I, there's just no way I could just pack it in and walk away from it. Um, and so uh, it's just a matter of, of stick to in it, sticking to it. Right, there we go. right, right. <laughs> and, um, and, and trying to uh, keep the, the standards of evidence and, and uh, evaluation as high and as rigorous as you can. Uh, given the uh, you know, given the uh, limitations of, of what we have to work with at this point, I mean, there's been an unfortunate uh, uh, lineup of, of, of uh, ridiculousness that we've that's been heaped on the subject, and, and and that's frustrating because that just adds to the sort of tabloid perception of the subject. You know, when I'm struggling and working hard to garner respectability at, for this endeavor as, as a legitimate scientific enterprise, 
that needs our attention. And then you have somebody parading around with a stuffed mannequin claiming that he shot Bigfoot. Um, you know, it, it's, it's distracting, unfortunately. It's pathetic, but it's, right. it's also rather distracting. Okay, well, I, uh, I always uh, mention this. I'm just going to mention this now before I start to let my mind wander. Uh, but all of the fans of this show that listen um, every night, uh, this is just a conversation. So now this is the, this is the point where you and I just kind of kick back and we're just going to talk, okay? So I need you to help me too as well because I, I, I want to be educated on this. And if you and I find this interesting... Um, I know that there are, are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people right now that are listening to this show that share my point of view where I want them to, because you have an, enough of your followers are listening to tonight. They're all sitting there going, okay, that's right. That's right. But, uh, it, you know, we need the, the, the other ones to get a little bit educated like myself. So, um, so let's just do that. Let's just have a conversation and I'm going to start off with this. I'm going to start off with some basics. What's the difference between Bigfoot and Sasquatch? It's just a a regional variant uh, of what it has been labeled. Sasquatch was uh, um, a term that was coined by J.W. Burns, uh, an educator in Canada, who tried to uh, anglicize um, a, a native term that had common elements throughout many of the languages in the Pacific Northwest there. And roughly translates wild man of the woods or man of the woods. Oh, an Indian, American Indian native tra- uh, word, in other right. words. Okay. So there isn't, uh, there isn't a difference then between Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Really? No. No, it's just uh, Sasquatch was uh, first coined and is more commonly used in Canada. Bigfoot was, uh, as it applies to this phenomenon, was coined in Northern California um, presumably by a newspaper editor who was impressed with the size of these feet. Uh, but because Bigfoot <laughs> okay, has gotcha, gotcha. carried the, the sort of tabloid stigma to a much greater degree, I, I tend to gravitate to and out of deference to the Native American um, a traditional knowledge of such a creature's existence. Right. I tend to, to gravitate to Sasquatch. And I try, I, I gravitate to Bigfoot. So we're already off on the wrong Bigfoot here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, aside from the Patterson film, which we're going to spend a lot of time on today, but I doubt that it's the Patterson film uh, that you would use like in the court of law and presenting a case. Um, there must be some hard, ev- I know you have a lot of it, but what would be the, you know, the, the first thing that you're going to put on the evidence table, What what is it? Well, from my position of, of uh, experience and expertise, the evidence that is the most compelling to me is the footprint evidence, the, the, uh, combined, sample uh, of of hundreds now of specimens of of footprints, photographs and casts and so on that uh, would seem to attest to the existence of of a creature, Um, a creature who's, uh, you know, a bipedal primate that um, uh, exhibits distinctions from the human foot that retains some primitive characteristics, but that shows um, uh, an overall functional morphology that it's is elegantly adapted <coughs> to the size and the habitat uh, of, of this alleged creature. And out of those hundreds of footprints, <coughs> is there, uh, I, oh, by the way, everybody, I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Meldrum on his screen. If, if you ever have to cough, give me the sound mute your microphone and, uh, <laughs> In his office, I just have to I'll paint a picture for everybody. It looks exactly like what you think it should look like. It's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Now, out of those hundreds of, uh, of casts, is there one set or two sets that you would uh, separate from the others? Well, if I, uh, if I had to do that, probably the, the, the cast that you alluded to in the introduction the cast of the footprints that I encountered in 1996 that really kind of set the hook as far as my intellectual curiosity goes. Um, This was an impressive 
trackway of some 35 plus footprints that were just absolutely clear and quite fresh in uh, in the sediment on this uh, muddy road, you know, in the, in the early spring of February. Well, t- and, tell me uh, about that. I'm curious about that uh, on how you found it and where you were um, and uh, were, were there, uh, any witnesses, not witness, was, was there, was there anybody else around or were you alone in the woods, uh, or no, was it, it in the woods yeah. or, you know, it tell, just tell me how that happened. It wasn't quite like that. Uh, I had uh, paid a surprise visit to Paul Freeman, um, an investigator in uh, the Walla Walla, uh, area of uh, Southeastern Washington. And, um, he had uh, made it a practice over the years to, as soon as the snows melted off of the, the lower roads in the foothills of the Blue Mountains there, he'd get out and cruise those roads. Many of them were, were uh, uh, not improved roads. They were just dirt tracks that uh, in the spring were very muddy and uh, showed a footprint very clearly. He had just found some, coincidentally it seemed to me, uh, upon our visit, and I was traveling with my brother, my younger brother. And uh, so he asked if, if we wanted to see some fresh tracks. He was, he was showing us at the time uh, his footprint cast collection in his home. And uh, I was a little incredulous, but I said, well, what have we got to lose here? We're here. Let's take a look. So we went up, and to make a long story short, I, it was just an, an amazingly impressive, very dynamic set of tracks that showed uh, uh, clear examples of the interaction of the, of the foot with the substrate. These weren't just rubber stamped imprints of a static carved wooden foot or some other, right. uh, you know, pro- lifeless prosthetic. The toes flexed where appropriate. They were extended. They were splayed. There was a mid-tarsal flexibility evident in the form of pressure ridges and half tracks. How did, I mean, you, was, how did you stumble upon these tracks? Well, he, he had found them, as I said, he made a habit of going out and cruising the roads. And on that particular morning, it was the first day where these lower foothill uh, uh, roads were clear of snow. Uh-huh. He could drive his four-wheel truck up there and, and you know, sit and look out the window as he's driving along for tracks crossing the road. He had found some just that morning. So we showed up unannounced. Uh-huh. My brother and I were traveling uh, through the region, and I wanted to visit with him at some point. So we decided to just drop in on him, and we did. And uh, after showing us his footprint cast, then I, you know he he looks at me, and says, "Well, you obviously know a lot about footprints. Do you want to see some fresh tracks?" I wow. looked at my brother, and I just kind of chuckled, and I said, "Well, what do you mean?" He said, well, "I found some this morning," and I thought, "Oh, how coincidental." Uh, did he find out that we were coming? Sometime? Right. Is that's, no well, that's do. my question. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. But even if he had an hour or two lead time, you know, it's a 20 minute drive up into those foothills. Right. At least. And, and here's this long stretch of tracks that he somehow plant would have had to have planted. Right. Uh, in such a way to show all these dynamic features and details of anatomy that as I was discussing them with him, pointing out the significance of, you know, of this bulge and, and this uh, this bend and so forth, you know, you could see it just kind of going over his head. Right, right. Had that sort of uh, that blank look that some of my students get on the yeah, first well, It would have been the same look on my face, actually. <laughs> but um, so did you feel your life change at that moment? Did you, uh, did the adrenaline rush? And did, were you just like, you know, I want to use foul language right now, you know, like whole, you know, I mean, yeah. was it like, was it that kind of moment? It was, it was. I mean, uh, there, literally the hair kind of stood up on the back of my neck is, as first as, as the, as the impact of seeing these, you know, very clear footprints. I, I was at the, at the time of my first visit with Paul, because of things that other people had said about him, I was very skeptical of his his reliability and his, his truthfulness. But after getting acquainted with him and then seeing these tracks, um, I, you know, I had uh, really no justification to, to harbor those reservations anymore. And there was that moment that, because I was at that, even at that point, because of my experiences growing up in the Pacific Northwest and, you know, previous interests in the, uh, as a aspiring 
uh, anthropologist, uh, right. aware of the phenomenon of Bigfoot, aware of Dr. Krantz's role in that phenomenon, in that uh, investigation of that phenomenon. I was keenly aware of, of the ridicule that he had suffered and right. the setbacks to his career. And, and yeah, there was that moment when I, I kind of thought, do I want to go down this path? Or right. was that fork in the road right there. Yeah, literally that path. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, looking at those footprints, it was like, how could I not? How, as, a, as a scientist, how could I not? investigate this has your friend now this is the skeptic side of me i'm just uh, the devil's advocate kind of guy i'm not stirring the pot but i'm going to ask the obvious and i'm sure everybody wants me to ask this question has he produced any other footprint since then or was that it and you never and you you know was was that the end of of that with him oh no no And, and this this came after uh, about 10 years of involvement on his part uh, pursuing this subject after he allegedly had an encounter uh, up on the boundary of the Mill Creek watershed where he was employed by the Forest Service to patrol. Um, he had accumulated, and, and you know, like I said, he was showing me his footprint cast over a collection. Over a period of about uh, 10 years, he had assembled about 40 plus items um, and some of them were multiple footprints in a single trackway. Uh, and it, and as I said, so you mean like, a, like, 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 like a family or something? Well, no, no. Well, there, there, there clearly were m- multiple individuals right. uh, inhabiting this area that are recognizable from repeat appearances of their footprints. Um, and so, no, I meant, uh, you know, if, if, in other words, if he encountered as I did, as, right. he, as he showed me a long line of tracks, he often would cast multiple examples in that footprint. Oh, I got you. I got uh, you. Okay. Track okay. And that, that's a very good thing to do so that you can compare and contrast the individual foot it, or imprints um, from one to the next in order to document variation. Now, when you look at a footprint, <clears throat> and again, this is the, uh, this is the uneducated side of me asking something that just may seem ridiculous to you, but, is each one different, like fingerprints that we have? I mean, are they different sizes? Different? The toes are always different. Everyone is distinct. You know, well, is, is every cast that you, every footprint, is everyone absolutely different? I'm asking because, you know, if somebody is out there hoaxing, that means they have to make a different foot, a different this. A, you know, everyone would have to be, different and somebody somewhere has got a collection of hundreds of fake feet in their garage. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. I do. Okay. So is each, each one different and anatomically correct, so to speak, where it makes sense to you? Um, uh, No, uh, each one is not different. And, you know, one of the questions, one of the first questions that I asked uh, that I pondered upon was if, if these creatures are as rare as they must be, to be seen as infrequently as they do and to leave as sign as infrequently as they do, then in a given geographical region, if tracks are found on multiple occasions, the chances of those being from one of those few individuals in that region should be pretty high. So I started looking for repeat, recognizable repeat appearances based on size and shape and toe disposition and configuration. And, uh, and yeah, example after example after example have come to the to the surface that, uh, that show these repeat appearances. Is there uh, uh, toe prints like fingerprints? Do, do you ever get really clear casts like that? Yes. And in fact, this, this very area uh, outside of uh, Walla Walla, uh, the, the uh, sediments there in the mountains contain a lot of very fine, fine particulate soils, what we call uh, glacial lus. And it's, uh, this, it's like talcum powder, like flour. And when it's wet or very, very dry uh, and, and loose, powdery, it will pick up that detail. And um, if the cast is made promptly and carefully, that detail can be transferred to the, the footprint. I only have about a half a dozen examples that show very distinct uh, ridge detail because those conditions are not, uh, are not that common, except in certain areas. Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, when, okay, 
when um well okay i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna change the 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 flow of this a little bit sure. with all of the uh bigfoot television shows that are on television today <laughs> Yeah. And I'm not in any way uh, saying anything bad about any of the programming. I'm not. But does that, all all of it out there, does it help or hurt your cause? That's the first question. And second, um, no, answer that first. Okay. Well, it, it, sometimes it's a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, I, I'm sometimes challenged for my participation in some of these documentaries, which have over the years, I think, increased uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, raised the bar in, in standards of, of, uh, of journalistic uh, um, quality. Uh, but, and, and while I don't have obviously ultimate control or, or final say on the content and the quality of, of, of the treatment of the subject, um, with very few exceptions, these have provided these these opportunities have provided me the chance to see to, to uh, speak to witnesses firsthand, to go to places I wouldn't otherwise ever have been able to go. Right. Like you mentioned my trip to China. That was that was uh, um, a result of, of one of the documentaries that I participated in, and it was a, a great opportunity to uh, expand my horizons and see evidence from from the other side of the globe. Well, for me, it's just the, I, I've watched a couple of, of the shows over the, the last few seasons, but I, it just seems to me that I know the ending. Yeah. You know, well, <laughs> well, that's the, yeah, that's the problem. I mean, we're, we're uh, at the mercy, unfortunately, of the of the formula of, of current cable networking, which is uh, quick and dirty. You know, um, these reality shows tend to be um, uh, produced on a shoestring. Um, and yet, they, it's amazing the following that they have. It's, he, there's a reason why it's on 24 hours a day on four different channels. Exactly. You know, there, <laughs> there's, such a, there's such a level of public interest in this subject, as, as so many others. I mean, I, it's not like Bigfoot has a, a market or a, 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 um, you know, it has a corner on the market. But, but it's interesting, you know, back when... Um, when uh, uh, I think it was Giganto, the real King Kong, or it was either that or it was it was Sasquatch Legend of Science. I can't remember which one now, but it coincided with the death of Ray Wallace and and the press that covered his alleged involvement in the Bigfoot subject and his family's claims of uh, hoaxing all these footprints. Well, the director of my my. Sources tell me my the, the producer said that the the director of marketing at that uh, company did everything, pulled every marketing um, uh, tool except and, and everything short of canceling the show because he he felt this this reflected very negatively on the network that they were doing a program right in the wake of all this supposed revelation of a hoax, and in spite of that, that documentary took in the largest market that they had ever had for that network and so it just shows that even even when uh, it's just spread by word of mouth there is such an undercurrent of interest that uh, that is pervasive well you know my little slip of the tongue uh forced me i with with the response i had no idea i really didn't <laughs> <laughs> uh, into, into, into you and I having this conversation now. And it's a, you're absolutely 100% right. You know, the, the, the public out there feels like they feel and, and I am way, way in the minority on this one. And I, and, 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 and it's not like I, I'm, I'm not a, a, a true skeptic on it, but my little point of view, uh, wow. You know, so yeah, there's a reason why, uh, the networks have all that programming up there, and but, but like I said, I, I just know the ending, you know. Well, <laughs> but they're, they're, and that and that's uh, you know again on, on a on a shoestring budget, they're they're only able to stay in a location for a, a couple of days at the most. For most of these productions, they they are not able to follow through. I mean, one of my desires is to have one of the networks really step up and and take the raise the bar that much higher so that 
um, so that there can really be some in-depth investigative reporting and, and following through with so many of these loose ends. But, but ultimately, I mean, ultimately, uh, it will always be the same ending until someone really does have a body or really does get DNA from hair that uh, identifies a novel species. Or takes one out for a drink. You know? That's right. Yeah. Now, um, aside from, okay, well, just let, I'm going to ask you directly. Is the Patterson footage real? Yes or no? And then I, well, we're going to move on. In my opinion, yes. Okay. I, I'm convinced. That, we'll, we'll, we're going to come back to that. But, okay, so aside from, and I don't mean to cut you off. I'm not being rude. But no. aside from the Patterson footage, is there anything, is there another piece of footage that you could show me where you would say, okay, Jimmy, now check this out. Well, um, the Patterson footage has, has, uh, has uh, set the standard so high, the standard of evidence for photographic um, um, evidence, uh, that it, it's difficult for anything to come close. The, the one that, that still, I think, is up there uh, because of all of the associative evidence as well is the, is the Freeman footage. Um, I still think that, that that stands a very good chance of being genuine. The associated footprints, you know, you talk about recognizable individuals, the footprints that uh, he was investigating at that site before this figure appeared um, are footprints of the same individual whose tracks I witnessed in 1996. Uh, uh, same size, same length, uh, same uh, configuration of the toes and, and exhibiting the rather unusual feature of the toes what we call them a Morton's foot, uh, which in which the second and third toe are longer than the first, but equal in length to one another, a fairly rare trait, um, genetic trait. So, um, I, I'm fairly confident that those tracks were just as credible as the tracks I witnessed in 1996. And if they were directly associated with the, the figure that stepped out from the tree and walked across that, uh, that opening then. Right, right. Well, right. if, if, if uh, the ufologist out there had a, a piece of film like the Patterson, you know, it would, it would be a whole nother ball game too as well. And they just don't have, you know, that just doesn't exist because you're right. The, the, the standard is set so high with uh, the Patterson footage to me. And I have, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, what I want to do. Well, you know what? We have 15 minutes left in, in this segment. Maybe we should jump into the Patterson footage, but there's uh, I have a couple of other things that uh, I wanted to ask you really quick. The Minnesota Iceman photographs, what do you think of that? Well, I think uh, uh, I, I, my, my suspicions are, in spite of the impressions of those who, who witnessed the, ori the original piece, um, are that that probably was uh, a, a contrivance. Um, I... Uh, and, you know, to be honest, I have not busied myself with a, a, an extremely thorough evaluation of all of the arguments, pro and con. I've, I've spoken to various people. In fact, the person who apparently brought it to the attention of Ivan Marks and, and Bernard Hovelmans actually phoned me one day. And we had an interesting conversation. And he certainly was impressed by what he originally saw. But the bottom line is, there's no body. And yeah, so right. The, the, it really doesn't matter what I think about it because it's uh, it's it's miss it's that proverbial missing evidence. It's the, the, the Raiders the, of the Lost Ark, uh, you know, crate in the back of the warehouse somewhere. Yeah. I'm telling you though, I had nightmares after uh, I first saw those pictures. So <laughs> the, really well done, but yeah, you know, it's almost too good to be true. Uh, but I had to, I had to jump in there and ask you about that. Let's spend some time then, uh, on the Patterson film. I, uh, a little bit about my background before we, uh, talk about this. I have, uh, an extensive audio and visual, uh, background and training. And for those, uh, out there that know me professionally know, uh, about my experience, and I've done a lot of lecturing and speaking around the country, around the world on uh, audio and visual editing and and production. So when I uh, when I look at the arguments pro and con, specifically about frame rate and film speed on this, it's one of the things that is overlooked 
because it's a lot of people don't understand about voltages in the United States and in Europe and why frame rates are what they are and and it doesn't make any sense and and it shouldn't you know if you look at something on your TV or you see something in the movie theater and it looks good to you that's all they care about but they don't understand how how it's done and why uh, why it's done the way it is uh, and so but the the arguments about frame rate and gate are the two strongest things for me in the film. Now, uh, we're, I'll get to the. Uh, I want your opinions on uh, uh, the 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 possibility of it being a suit or not, because I, I don't see that. I don't see that being faked from what I can see. But frame rate and gate uh, is something that you have addressed directly, and. And f so for everybody out there, uh, we're going to be talking about frame rates and gate and, and why that is important. Gate being uh, the stride and, and the way uh, some, somebody walks. So I want you to explain gate a little bit because we're going to talk about frame rates and gate quite a bit and what, what that really means. So what is a gate? Well, the gate is just the description of the pattern of steps in uh, in moving from point a to point b um, the way in which a um, uh, the uh, per, well parameters such as step length straddle um, uh, how the center of gravity is translated through space and weight has a lot to do with that as well of course yeah yes. weight and size that the mass the the length of the of the limb segments they're you know, they're the moments of inertia, the pendulum moments is of arms that are are more or less passively swinging during uh, during a, uh, a normal walk or not <laughs> or not swinging. Or not. Exactly. <laughs> uh, right. You know, the way I walk. Um, but um, OK. And 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 frame rate. Now, the reason why frame rate is so important to me uh, and for anybody that has a, uh, a professional knowledge in, in filmmaking and, and video production, they know about frame rate and what it does to what you are seeing, uh, on the screen. And, and I only, I need to make emphasis on this because when you watch something that is filmed at a slower frame rate, then you watch it at normal speed um, it's, it's either in, or it could either be fast or slow. And so, um, and if anybody's ever seen a car chase on TV on, on an old, old, uh, 1930s bank robbery gangster film, and you see the car racing through the streets, that's filmed at a slow frame rate. And then when it's brought up to speed, then the car is recklessly running through town. So, uh, Patterson, now, uh, I don't know if we should spend some time on who Roger Patterson is, and, and certainly we, we can take all the time we want, but Roger Patterson had jumped off his horse. And, uh, okay, well, you know what? Before we get to that, let's set up uh, for everybody out there that doesn't understand or isn't familiar with uh, Roger Patterson and, and Bob Gimlin uh, uh, how they came about shooting this. Let's take a couple of minutes and, and go ahead and set that up. Uh, the two of them were up in uh, where, Bluff Creek, I think. Right, Bluff Creek in Northern California. Roger had, uh, his interest had been piqued in this subject after having read a, an article in, I think it was Argosy Magazine by Evan Sanderson. He had uh, he'd been poking around around Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams area and uh, had uh, you know he was always uh, inventing something always trying to work an angle with some contraption and so he apparently went to, to california to to los angeles or wherever to, to try to market some of these on on uh, occasion and so had the opportunity when passing through northern california to look into some of these stories that ivan sanderson had related in his articles and um one individual al hodgson uh, became acquainted with him, uh, or he with uh, him, vice versa. And, and um, Roger had asked that should something ever come to his attention, to let him know. Well, a long line of tracks were were discovered on the Blue Creek Mountain Road. And these remain controversial or 
I'm sure some of your listeners would attribute these to the carved wooden feet that the Wallaces have, uh, right. have produced. But in any case, um, Al Hodgson was also good friends with John Green in British Columbia. And so he contacted him first. And uh, so John and Rene de Hinden came down and, and it was one of the most thorough investigations of a line of tracks uh, uh, carried out by those two individuals. They also brought down an anthropologist from the museum in British Columbia, Don Abbott, to investigate. Um, once they were done, and unfortunately there there was uh, weather had can't come in and the ambitions to have tracking dogs were thwarted and so forth and so forth. But eventually Al contacted Roger. And uh, so Roger was anxious to come down. He was apparently attempting to produce a documentary and wanted uh, footage of fresh tracks to include. It took him a couple weeks. He, he had to prevail on Bob to use Bob's uh, truck and trailer and, and, uh, and uh, some of the horse flesh to get down there. Bob had to put his affairs in order. So it was about two weeks later. By the time they got down there, these tracks that they'd wanted to see were, were pretty much a mess and uh, nothing much left of them to, to photograph or film. And so they spent about two weeks down there riding the roads, driving the roads at night and so forth. And, and about, um, after about two weeks, that's when, uh, when they had the encounter. Now, but, one, of, one of the key things for the Patterson film even to, to be what it is was he happened to rent a professional camera. Right. Not not a little eight millimeter wind up out of the Sears catalog camera situation, but he had a professional camera, professional lens that shot at multiple speeds. Sure, you know, and that is a very fortunate thing, and that's why that film, uh, uh, that's why it was captured like it was. I mean, you can almost count hairs, you know, on, <laughs> on Bigfoot if you know what I mean. Very lucky. That in and especially in, in the '60s, like that, to to have a have a camera like that at at that moment in time. So now, and I want to be perfectly clear on this. And you're more of an expert as, than I am. Um, and again, I'm coming at this as a view of skeptic, but I have studied this film as much as anything in my life. I have checked it out. I have looked at the stabilized version. Thousands of times. I, I, I can't emphasize enough. So, like I said, if there's one thing in your corner, it's this. But um, so they, they, the two of them are writing. Now, Gimlin, wasn't he like, he was armed. His reason for being there was just in case he had to shoot Bigfoot. Or something. <laughs> Am well, I right I, about I that? They, they both were armed, but uh, Roger's horse had bolted. It right. reared right. and fell on its side. Roger jumped off, grab, grabbing the camera from the saddlebag but his horse had run off the pack horse had pulled loose and run off um and they surprised bigfoot because they had or sasquatch they had come around a, a tree and and it was like boom there there he was right in front of him so he had to get his camera and then somehow start shooting um and not startle that you know you don't want bigfoot to run off so, but he's trying to, that, that's the, like the shaky part of the film. Right, right, right. They, uh, and it, the Bigfoot had already started to retreat. She immediately apparently turned and, and uh, uh, began retreating away from the pair uh, with Roger running across the creek, shooting as he ran. And then he, he literally ran into a sandbar that was uh, several feet tall. And, and in a way, fortunately, because that stopped him in his tracks and he he held the camera very steady and uh, captured that very famous steady se segment. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was uh, heading off uh, from left to left stage to right stage there. Now that you said you said a key word there, she, she. Yeah. Now, again, I don't know why with this film. Why the emph emphasis, you know, uh, I hate to do this, um, but I'm going to say it again. It is, uh, it seems like I do this on every show, but it's so easy to play the part of debunker. Right? It's, it's like the easiest gig in the world. So with a film like this, nobody ever wanted to even see this film in the beginning. 
just because of what it was. Oh, it's Bigfoot. Oh, man, come on. So nobody wanted to take it serious. Nobody wanted to look at it. And as far as debunking, nobody wants to hear about things like film speed or, um, uh, for me, uh, she's got boobs. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why, if you're going to go, um, and I, I need you to to comment on this, but you're you're the anthropologist. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just a guy. But that is the one thing. If I'm going to fake something like this and go and put a costume together, I just don't think breasts come into play. You know, <laughs> I, I am going to do. Uh, 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 what's a uh, King Kong mask? You know what I mean? Yeah, why? Right. Why breastuses? You know, and and so well, okay, go ahead. I mean, but, well, but I was just going to say the the argument could be made, plain devil's advocate, that um, they were constrained by the size of a human actor, and so rather than portray, rather than attempt to portray a massive male that that the legends describe as anywhere from seven to 10 feet in height, uh, let's work on a smaller scale and let's depict a female. And so um, we get uh, uh, a, a, uh, you know, a size range somewhere from six to seven feet in height. Um, and so we put breasts on it to make it obvious that it's a female. And others would argue that he was influenced by William Rowe's depiction of a female Sasquatch with very prominent breasts. Yes, but I do you uh, your uh, do you think Patterson was that smart? Oh, I think he was quite a clever guy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if if he were if he were setting out to hoax this, yes, I think he he could have thought of those types of things. I, I don't. I don't. You know, well, no, that, no, no. Is. I'm not saying anything bad about Patterson. I, yeah, not no, at no. all. I'm just saying. Why those kind of angles coming into a hoax for me? No, 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 no. And um, now concerning um, the female structure, right. is that uh, accurately depicted? Oh, absolutely. And, and this is one of the one of the things I do have my hands in. I'm collaborating with. Bill Munns, who's a, a, a well, well known in the Bigfoot community now, mm -hmm. who had a career in Hollywood as a costume designer, fabricator, and uh, actually appeared in some movies in those costumes that he created. Uh, but he's also a very talented anatomist, uh, uh, anthropologist, has done, um, I mean, in the sense that he's done very, very excellent anthropological reconstructions using his skills. Um, one of the questions we've addressed is the the nature of that breast tissue and uh, th there's a particular sequence of frames where as patty's walking her foot placement she apparently uh, misjudged the um a, 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 the presence of a depression right in in the um, sandbar there and so she came down with a bit of a jolt a jarring step yep and and the percussion that the repercussion of that uh, that step, its shockwave that it generates, can actually be seen traveling up her leg and through the breast tissue. Yes. So it has this uh, flattening effect, um, which only through experimentation we could replicate with real models, with real tissue, real adipose tissue. Right. Not the various uh, materials that were typically used in uh, like, uh, like the various types of rubbers and, and so forth. Now, some argue, what about a what about a water balloon? This was actually one of my thoughts too. Right. But and then in discussing that with uh, with uh, with Bill, that then requires some pretty skilled tailoring work to model the fur cloth around. And this is non-stretch fur cloth in 1967, just fabric with the hair attached or, or artificial hair attached to tailor that to a rounded. Um, uh, it's okay. Say yeah, it. a rounded breast. Yes. I'm trying to think of the, the a rounded water balloon. Yes. Yes. Sack fluid or silicon or whatever, and to have it have a natural shape, and for have that having that shape uh, stretch and deform in non-stretchable fabric is just not not uh, reasonable at all. Okay, we're at the top of the hour. This is a good spot to take a break, and uh, we'll be back. We'll continue this. Bigfoot breast talk when we come back, but uh, I have, uh, 
uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, when we come back, Doctor, about uh, Planet of the Apes. <laughs> okay. We'll be back right after this. This is Fade to Black. We are with Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, and he's doing a good job. He's doing a good job trying to convince me that there is a Bigfoot. We'll be back right after this on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Don't touch that mouse. One eight hundred nine one six six two three two. That's the number you need to call when you are seeking spiritual enlightenment and searching for your true purpose here on earth. www.lovespellstoday.com. They provide psychic readings, love spells, reversal of spells, custom spells, chakra balancing, energy work. Divine guidance is just one phone call away. Call 1-800-916-6232 for your free psychic reading. I did. And tell them Jimmy sent you. Hello, I'm Jimmy, and you're listening to my very man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. My name is Nick Dominguez. Hi, I'm Rex Dominguez, and I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Jimmy is your preacher. Amen. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're, We're the Honey Brothers. brothers. <laughs> We're of oh, the Honey Sorry, Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. KJCR. JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. All right, everybody, welcome back. KJCR, this is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Yes, we have uh, our guest tonight is Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum talking about Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Shoot us an email. I have got uh, about 10 emails lined up in front of me right now. I'll, uh, I'll try to get to them. We've got a lot we want to cover, and if uh, the good doctor will allow us, maybe we will uh, actually run over tonight. Um, we'll see if we can talk him into that. But uh, shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. I know we've got some links up and some photographs, uh, some cool Bigfoot stuff up, so go over to jimmychurchradio.com. Check that out. Comment. Go to the forum section. As always, I will jump into the forums tonight after the show and hang out with everybody. Uh, the call-in number is 323-825-5045, and we'll try to get to your calls tonight as well. I know that uh, that will get backed up, and uh, it's going to be a fun night. Okay, so let's uh, continue. Doctor, are you uh, still with us? I still am. <laughs> um, uh, okay. The thing is for me, and... And I'm not putting down the Hollywood uh, special effects industry and and some of the guys like Stan Winston that I have a very high amount of respect for, if not the highest. But the quality of work that they were doing back then and the Patterson film, I'm sorry. That's where my BS meter just goes off. They don't coexist. They are not in the same realm. And the best that we could do back then, and it was great, was Planet of the Apes. You know, and if you know where I'm going with this, you look at Planet of the Apes. And I love the, I love the, I love all five movies. I love them all. Charlton Heston was the. I love them, but you know, you're looking at a monkey suit. Okay, there is a difference there. And when you watch the Patterson film. The if that is a hoax, if the Patterson film is a hoax, then why isn't that guy? Why didn't I see that in Planet of the Apes? Exactly. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's a very good argument. And 
you know, these, these abilities, these skills um, uh, have been kept, uh, kept private since then. I mean, there, there, there are some other examples. I, I know someone has drawn some interesting um, parallels to the ape in uh, 10, 10 million years B.C. Yes, yes. Welch. Yes, yes. But you hardly ever see that creature. And, and the comparisons are almost, you know, um, superfluous because, uh, uh, the, again, those talents were never, were never really showcased, were never really used in the industry. Well, uh, and this is this is the thing for me is that if that is a suit, then how did he get it on? OK, I don't see a zipper. I don't see drawstrings. It was it, you know, is it booties with mittens or, you know, is it some kind that, that you can't see? Any seams, and so is it? Was is it sprayed on? I, you know, because the, they just weren't doing that good. Of I, I, I don't. I'm just blown away that that somebody wants to think that that is a suit because you can't show me that it's a suit. Do you follow right. my so, Do you follow my thought here? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, you know, it often gets um, um, uh, dismissed or or brushed aside. But one of the most uh, famous ape impersonators of that period for uh you know was appeared on camera and 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 uh in, in in his interview uh said quite adamantly that if this was a if this was a, was a suit it had to be hair glued on to the surface of the actor and he said that would take hours and hours and hours of time let alone uh overlooking the fact that you would have to find someone with that physique because there's no there's no potential for building up and amplifying someone's uh, body frame with artificial materials, if they were even available back then, which they weren't. Right, the and which takes us to the point of the conversation now with gait and film speed. Because yeah. now <clears throat> the film has been shot. He doesn't remember what film speed he shot it at. Am I correct on that? He doesn't actually remember. Right. Well, he wasn't sure he, he would have he would have expected or anticipated that he had the camera set at 22 frames per second, 24 or, or 24, excuse me, yep. for, for broadcast quality. Right. But when he looked at the camera, it was set at uh, near the 18 frames per second. He was guessing 16 or 18, 16 or 18. And I and I and I've been told that it's a snap dial. And yes. So yes. there wasn't uh, intermediates. But the point being that. It, it's pretty straightforward to confirm one or the other simply by, you know, Dr. Krantz did it by using this moment of, pen, of the pendulum swing of the arms. Mm -hmm. uh, others have looked at it by, based on the amount of motion blur that can be seen. Right. Uh, Dr. Donsky of Russia um, commented that if it was at, shot at the lower film speed, that uh, it couldn't have been an actor. It would have the, the the gate would have been unnatural for a human. And I was able to talk to him um, and and share with him some of these studies that had been done that had pretty much confirmed the the film speed. Didn't uh, he take it uh, a step further and actually like use the word impossible? He did. Yeah. Okay. He was quite. He was rather emphatic. Yes. And, he was. and I asked him, will, "Will you stand by that?" Now, knowing what I've shared with you about the various studies that have looked at, at all these different aspects, these different angles, including also the, the vertical oscillations of the camera that roughly coincide with the step uh, speed of Roger as he's running and walking yep. with the camera. Um, and, and again, the, the faster film speed would make it impossible for him to have, have, uh, have uh, run at that speed and, and moved his legs so quickly. Even with a, a man of, of shorter stature as Roger was. Yeah. Well, remember what I was commenting earlier about the 1930s gangster car running through right. town, because right. that's what you would have. Well, well exactly. And, and, and most frequently, when you see the Patterson film shown on television for some reason, at least for years, until these discussions, I guess, became more widely known, it was usually shown at the, at, as if it were shot at 24 frames per second. Right. And it looked like a Keystone cop. Yeah, it looks fake. <laughs> so, um, 
with um, okay, now there's an there's another part to this for uh, for everybody that they need to understand. And uh, again, I've studied this probably a little bit too much, and for me to still come away as being a skeptic after what you know the comments that I made uh, last week about the Patterson film in your absence, but is this, and this is a key part of, of the Patterson film, and a, a lot of the. A lot of the things with with the Patterson film, it's it's a lot of little tiny things that that add up. And this is this is one of the things is that I really believe that uh, Bob Gimlin, um, if it was a hoax, then he had no part of it. Right. I, I know. I, I really believe that. And yeah. and and so, which means that he was uh, he was duped. And he was used as uh, uh, an excuse for because he would not have known anything. So then, therefore, he couldn't lie about anything, and and he would be their one credible guy because he would be telling the truth about what happened. But that means that uh, Patterson was really smart. How he had this set up, where he had somebody lying in wait in the best. A uh, gorilla costume known in the history of modern man, and they stumble upon him uh, on horseback, and everything just happens to just click off right in a row. They have to follow Bigfoot into the woods for a couple of months. You know, the whole thing. And that's where I just feel like uh, it has to have been a real event. Gimlin said later on, as you know, 20 years later, 25 years later, that, hey, man, if it was a hoax, then I didn't know anything about it. You know, and 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 I think that is something that is genuinely overlooked by those debunkers out there. And and you're uh, you're leaving out the one real critical point, too, that if he wasn't in on it, whoever was in the costume was taking his life in his hands because. Bob was there with a rifle. That's exactly my point. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I forgot to see. That's what happens when I, I run without notes. But, but that was but, my point. Yeah. He was he was there to shoot Bigfoot. <laughs> that was his job. And yeah. you're absolutely right. Somebody could have gotten shot. And, and I think the way that Gimlin portrayed later, I think he would have gotten a shot off if he wasn't worried about, A, the horses that were running, and B... Uh, Patterson running with the camera and his stumbling and him possibly needing his assistance. That's the way that I read into it. And, and I think that, I don't know if you share the same view, but um, that's why he didn't get a shot off. Well, they had in, in conversations I've had with him, he reiterated that they had agreed that they would not shoot it unless it was, unless they felt threatened. But he made that comment. He said, <clears throat> you know, when asked what, <laughs> about the possible implications if this had been a man in a fur suit. And he said, if that thing had stopped and turned around and headed back towards them, he was prepared to shoot it. Do you believe uh, Gimlin? I know you think the film is real, but I mean, how does he come across to you? I've never met him, but I mean, you know, was he, I guess what I'm trying to say is if it was a hoax, then he's still telling the truth. So it doesn't really matter. So do you, do you believe uh, his position? I do. I do. I mean, I've, I've had the good fortune and privilege to, to uh, you know, to get well acquainted with him and, and to count him as a close friend now. And, and we've had many, many times to sit down and visit. And it was funny. We uh, were both speaking at a, at a conference in, um, in Washington at one point, and, and they put us in the same hotel. And so we shared our meals together and uh, over dinner, interestingly, there wasn't a word spoken about Bigfoot. We spent the whole time talking about our family and our history and past jobs and travel. And uh, because the the Bigfoot issue, I mean, I didn't have any more questions for him and I accepted his word. And, you know, he's the, he's the straightest arrow you could ever imagine. You can't spend five minutes with him and not conclude that he's the salt of the earth. The, the thing uh, the, about the follow-up on the film after the film uh, is shot and Patterson is eager to get down to Los Angeles and get the film developed. And who was the, uh, th- they brought up a doctor to look at the footprints. What was his name? Crank, um, Krantz? No, no. Grover didn't have any direct uh, involvement with it at, at that 
point that uh, okay uh, they they had made arrangements to try to bring some tracking dogs down but unfortunately the 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 uh, cloud bursts and flash flooding and it was all they could do to get their vehicles out of uh, across the creek which was raising uh, rising very rapidly and uh, get up out out of the canyon uh, before uh, the road uh, mudslides and so forth uh, took them out okay um, so they didn't I thought that they they attempted to bring some people up to look at the tracks really quick but but when I'm uh, when he, when Patterson gets back to LA this is where again I will come to his defense and there's always two ways to look at everything but in his position Patterson was broke okay he owes he owes people a couple of hundred dollars here and there obviously the guy didn't have any money and he comes back to LA and if I have got if I just shot Bigfoot and I owe some people some money and maybe I got rent and I've got to feed my family and I got to do what I got to do. And I've got this film. I'm going to do what I have to do with this film. What are you going to do? Of course you're going to try to market it or, or get some money from a film company to finish your film or do something with, because it's all you got. And that argument about him coming back and trying to publicize it, it's easy for me to go, what did you expect him to do? I would have done the same thing. Right, exactly. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he, he would, didn't return to L.A., though, just just to make me a point of clarification, though. he They were living in Yakima, Washington, and they, they returned there. They had uh, air freighted, as the story goes, air freighted the, the film to his uh, brother-in-law, to Atlee, Alda Atlee, and, and he arranged to have it it um, uh, developed. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I, I don't think, <clears throat> I think it's missing the forest for the trees to nitpick uh, imposing your own uh, expectations of human behavior on, on someone and a behavior, like you said, that would be very natural. I mean, of course, he's going to try to make some money to help support his family. Um, I, I don't, I, I think it's, you were better off to go back to the film I mean, even if you can, if you seem to can to be able to punch holes in the story of of the um, chain of custody of the film, you still then have to account for what's on the film. Exactly, and, and that's a discussion we were having before. I mean, it's uh, you know, it, it puts uh, Planet of the Apes, which got all kinds of accolades for its uh, its uh, 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 cutting edge, innovative uh, costume techniques and so forth. Uh, it puts that to shame. When you uh, when you talk about the ratios of, um, and I'm I'm just depending on my on my uh, brain here, but when you talk about, I don't know the exact terminology, but the ratios of the arms uh, uh, on a humid on a on a humid versus uh, a gorilla or other bipedal type of it why why does it stand out so much because when i look at the film i look at um arms that are just extremely long and 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 you can see the hands and it just doesn't look human to me in fact I, there's no question that that it isn't human but how did you uh, what is it called and 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 tell us about your research into that well, in anthropology, the, the ratio of the upper limb to the lower limb is referred to as the intermembral index. That's why I didn't and, remember. <laughs> yeah. and, and the intermembral index is, is very revealing. I mean, we use that in studying uh, uh, primate locomotion because there's such a good correlation between those values and the, the adaptation, the strategy uh, of, of animals um, uh, to move about through their environment. So we have an intermembral index uh, that's, a, that's on average about uh, in the 70s. Our upper limb is about 70% of the length of the lower limb. Gorillas and chimps have much, much longer arms that exceed the length of the lower limb, so their index is in excess of 100. Their upper limbs are you know, like 120% the length of the lower limbs. Um, when we look at the Sasquatch, or the Bigfoot in the Patterson-Gimlin film, you can very uh, accurately, actually, uh, identify centers of, of, uh, of joint motion. 
the centers, the axes of rotation of those joints. Um, and using those to calculate the length of the arm from the shoulder to the wrist and from the hip to the ankle, this creature has an intermembral index that is, falls well outside the range of variation for humans. It's up in the range of 80 to 90 percent. When, um, when, when, when we talk about it in those terms, how many, uh, what's the length in inches that we're talking about? Well, again, you have to first settle on an absolute scale for, for the creature, and there still remains some controversy over that. But when uh, you say what, what well, the height is, yeah, right, right, okay. But um, uh, but when you're talking about a human being being at you know a seventy percentile, and uh, uh, let's just say this Sasquatch is in in the Patterson film six six and a half feet tall. So okay, the, uh, okay so based on that, are we talking about a foot? Are we talking twelve inches, six inches, an arm length that is different. Is different. Oh well. Um, if, if you, you know, whereas our span, uh, of from fingertip to fingertip with our arms held out to our sides is almost equivalent to our height, to our stature, right? This creature probably would have an, yeah, I would, I would probably say just, you know, off the cuff here, uh, an extra foot of span in its arms, given it's, it's greater length. So, you know, an extra six inches. And uh, how, how would that be in your in your expertise, how would that be possible to imitate? Well, it, it wouldn't. I mean, uh, the, the only arguments that are, are put forward is that the, um, the, the mittens, as you referred to them, the, the gloves or mittens that covered the hands, uh, the hands might not be all the way down into the fingertips so that, that it would appear that the fingers are longer. Uh, Philip Morris, who claims that that's his costume on the on the screen, uh-huh. he says that he instructed Roger how to cut off broom handles, right? Wooden extensions that you would just hold. <laughs> but the problem, you do that, and the forelimb is elongated, but you can't change the position of your elbow, and you can't move the hand because there is no actual hand there. Uh-huh. That's a broomstick, exactly. And it's- and I, I, I when I read that argument years ago, and I had read that, and I remember going back and oh wait a minute, so I had to look at the film again just to to check that. It's like the the most ludicrous. I mean, where does it where does that even come from? Because yeah. it's not there. I mean, I know you know. Um, so with uh the, with the film speed with this uh, with this ratio with the weight and, and everything else, how can somebody uh, come at you again? Because it just seems to me like the evidence is, is I now, I, again, I'm a skeptic as it comes to Bigfoot, but the film is real. Do you understand my position? <laughs> uh, well, no, actually, I don't. I mean, you can't have your cake and eat it, too, I guess. You know? Yeah, you know. So, and, that, and, and, and that's why, you know, when you were talking about what evidence would you bring forward in a in a court of law for, for consideration, um, right there, right close behind. And because it's actually uh, very intimately related, some of the best footprint evidence we have comes from the Patterson Gimlin film site where Bob Titmus cast 10 footprints in succession and, uh, which included some that exhibited remarkable dynamics. And of course, Roger selected the clearest, crispest, flattest, uh, prints that he could find, most complete prints that he could find, which were almost like a mold of the foot. So the detail in those casts is really quite remarkable. I mean, the, the copies that are, have been promulgated around are, are not, don't show that quality. But when you look at the photos of those pristine, fresh casts in those tracks, I mean, the, the detail, the toe stems, the, the outline, the proportion just uh, they're they're so natural, so so realistic looking. Um, I don't know how how you can not be, especially when you have the foot that left the footprints visible in the film and can see the mid tarsal flexibility, can see the dorsiflexion of the toes during the swing. You know, you can see these uh, anatomical features that correlate with the dynamic signatures of the, the tracks themselves, and and it's a remarkably coherent uh, picture. Can I talk you into an extra 15 minutes if I don't take a commercial break? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm not in any rush. So okay. Whatever. whatever. Fantastic. Because now I'm going to put the gloves on a little bit. <laughs> <laughs>
why okay why haven't we found a body well there's not a short answer really for that um but i think it, it hinges on on two uh, two aspects one deals with the nature of the beast itself and that is if we're dealing with a large bodied uh, primate then um, its life expectancy is long its reproductive rate is very low um, it's at the top of its food chain has no natural predators if it survives infancy disease and, and accident and so forth it's going to live probably to a ripe old age a half century perhaps in the wild even uh, so a death is going to be a very rare event. It's not like thousands of deer dying of winter kill annually, you know, in, in all the state of, in, in the entire state of Idaho, for example. I suspect there's probably only 50 or 60 Sasquatch if, if, they're, if they're dispersed as, as, uh, as um, rarely as, as I believe they are. And so you, you look at that demographic, you know, there's only probably... In, of those 50, maybe five that are getting close to uh, passing. And so a death may occur, you know, every 10 years. So you've got one body every 10 years in the entire state of Idaho and in the Pacific Northwest and near Mountain West, you have wet coniferous forests that contribute to a very acidic soil. You, calcium is at a premium so that there are lots of rodents, porcupines, pack rats, so forth, that, uh, that chew up bone very, very quickly. Um, volcanic soils, like of the Cascade Range, and even here in Idaho, the Idaho Batholith is, is a, a basalt rock, which also contributes to more acidic soils. Um, do, they so, bear, do you think they bury the dead? I don't. <clears throat> I don't, because, because I don't see any evidence from my own experience that suggests that they have more complex social structure. I think they're largely solitary, or at least when they're out foraging out about during much of their time, they're alone. And so if one were to die, um, you know, who's going to bury them? Are they, how, they, how are the others going to be aware that that one needs to be buried, needs to be carted off somewhere? So I, I think it's just a matter of a, a large animal that dies a natural death. When it becomes old and decrepit, it secretes itself off in some out of the way place, you know, and, it's, and that's not a extraordinary explanation. You know, the fact that we don't find bodies is not in itself a damning observation. You know, I, Grover used to, uh, Dr. Krantz used to routinely ask people he came in contact with that were hunters, uh, how many had ever found a, a bear skeleton in the wild that had died a natural death. And in the 20 some years that he asked that question, not a single person. I don't ask it as uh, religiously as he did, but in the times I've asked, I've only had one person, and they found a skull. So they don't know that that bear hadn't been shot or hadn't been hit by a car. Or, well, that's but, but that's my that's exactly where I was going. You may not I I, I understand you may not find a, a bear carcass in the woods if ever, but you know what? You hit them with your car all the time. You, do. you know you hit deer all the time. Yeah. You well, know we we, we might surmise that a large primate with the brain the size of a gorilla is a little smarter than your average bear as yogi would say well <laughs> so avoiding cars on a highway isn't a real isn't really rocket science and if right. you're if you're beyond instinctual impulsive uh, behaviors then maybe uh, you know well you know I, I, not the, I was hit by a car once. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> uh, it was a cop car, too. Yeah, that's a whole other story. I'll tell you about that off the air. Okay, so, but uh, it, the intelligence angle, is it is it that um, they just are avoiding, they're smart enough to avoid um, human beings? Are they just constantly one step ahead of us? As we started to populate the United States, and you know, obviously, there's a lot of rural areas. I mean, you know, tens of thousands of miles of you know that where we've never walked. But um, it, are they just one step ahead of us, where they just completely avoid us like the plague? Is that it? Is that the key here? Where even though we're out there looking, they're just constantly <laughs> moving one step further away. Well, there really aren't that many people out there looking. I mean, they're, they're the weekend warriors who go out and... Uh, well, there's hunters. 
there's, there's recreational there's guys on motorcycles and goofing around and skiers and snowmobiles and you live up in Idaho. You know what the vacation, you know, uh, is like. They're, sure. ne- they're not necessarily but, but, Bigfoot uh, hunters. I'm not, but I go out and ski. Sure. Well, but in, in those areas, like if, if you're, I mean, even if you're a cross country skier, uh, which are fewer and further between, but uh, if you're downhill skier, you know that you're in a very restricted area. If you're on a snowmobile, you're scaring away all the wildlife for miles, probably. Same with a motorcycle or a four wheeler. Right. Um, you know, it, uh, and there's lots of hunters who, um, who never fill that tag. Uh, and uh, lots of deer that avoid hunters altogether, especially the big bucks that are, are, are small are, are, are quite smart and clever at avoiding, avoiding hunters. But again, we're talking about a difference in, in, uh, of, of many orders of magnitude in, in numbers right. of, of individuals. Right, right, right. And so your chances, you know, but on the, on the flip side of that, people are seeing them, are finding them. I mean, in, and, uh, you know, I, I had to laugh one time when a caller was, uh, berating me for accepting eyewitness testimony and he was going on about all of the, the foibles of, of, um, of memories and, and uh, you know, uh, recollections of, of experiences and citing different sources and so forth. And then as the conversation ensued, he finally, just in frustration, said, if there was an 800-pound gorilla out there, people would be seeing it. <laughs> and I said, well, no, wait a minute. You just said we can't rely on any eyewitness testimony. People are seeing it. And they do, you know. I think that their intelligence uh, is is uh, is um, a two edged sword. It it would certainly assist them in avoiding human contact, but I think they have a much higher level of curiosity, intellectual curiosity, and that's why you know we have sightings of the man stepping out of the cabin to the woodpile to see a Bigfoot peering in through the plate glass window, the picture window, at what's going on in the in the uh, lit uh, uh, family room. What do you what do you do when you hear? Uh, do you do you have a hotline or you know your connections with everybody around the world? You know some footprints show up. Do you jump on a plane and head out with your plaster cast kit and and get there as quick as possible? How do you how do you go about that? Yeah, no, unfortunately, I really don't have the luxury uh, or the budget, uh, luxury of time or the budget to to take that approach. As much as I'd enjoy doing that. Um, uh, one of the ways that I, I, I try to uh, facilitate the flow of data, of information to me, is to help instruct other people. My field guide was an, an effort to um, try to educate people in, in some of those techniques so that they had, uh, you know, could build up a little confidence about how one should go about collecting data, collecting specimens like hair, or if it's justified, scat, or... Um, how to make a plaster cast of a footprint and document that in a, in a useful way. Now, how do you deal with, uh, like this incident that happened? I, I, you know what? I can't let you get away without me asking or talking about Siberia and China. So let's talk about yeah. those two things. Okay. So you, you go to Siberia. There's all this publicity about you getting out there and finally – yeah, I think most of us that had heard about it were sitting on the edges of our seats, just like you probably, you know, you were in the same position. Um, tell, tell me about what happened and, and how did it, how did it end? <laughs> well, Siberia first. The, let's, let's talk about Siberia first and we'll talk about Siberia China. First. Okay. I actually uh, made, uh, have made two trips to Russia. One was to ultimately to Siberia and, and that was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, the uh, you know frustrated with the the uh, the deafness of the scientific community even there in Russia, uh, Igor had had taken a very different tack, and that was to try to recruit the enthusiasm or the support of the political machine, and to get politicians and local uh, administrators and so forth on board. Well, of course, they recognizing that this is a golden goose, just just like many people here uh, certainly exploit it um, for for uh, commercial ends in the United States. Um, it, it took the conference took on more of an air of that uh, type of an endeavor. We didn't undertake an expedition as it was suggested in the in the papers. Rather, we uh, it was a field trip. It was a field trip to show us an interesting site. This. 
is uh, as is Azizkaya Cave, um, which was interesting. I was very interested. In it. It's only thirty kilometers away from the site where the Denisovan hominids were discovered. Uh, this this new hominid species. But unfortunately, the cave was not so remote. I mean, it was a it was a tourist site. I mean, in the dining area of the cabin we were in, there were pictures of snowmobilers that had gone out to the cave. And it, since it's a wet cave in the winter time, it's beautiful. It's like an ice palace in there. But there were signs. There were pop cans and candy wrappers. I mean, people had been there. And unfortunately, it just you know I won't go into all of the details, but. Uh, but I, I have to say, in my opinion, that the, the footprints, the quote unquote footprints that we were shown or that were discovered there were, were not natural and um, did not uh, represent occupation of that cave by, by an Almaski. How did uh, you, you've seen a lot of footprints. It's your job. Was yeah. it immediate? Did you just look and go, no? Yeah, they, they were very odd shape the the anatomy wasn't wasn't correct at all and there was only there were only right feet um say what wait, wait, the wait, left wait. foot at home of the truck or something but, um, i'm laughing so with you a, i'm laughing with you i'm not laughing at you okay I, yeah there was a succession of right and, and unfortunately forgetting that the cameras were rolling right there was a huge press entourage with us I facetiously said, what's a uh, you know, Bigfoot playing hopscotch? And, of course, that made it on the national news coverage. <laughs> so uh, that was, you, know, you got to be careful what you say. <laughs> well, uh, how'd you get to the airport alive? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you now, know. I, more in, much more interesting than that trip, actually, although there were some, there were some good things that came out of that trip. I was able to replicate five examples of some of the footprint evidence that have been collected from various areas in Russia, uh-huh. from Amir and Altai Mountains down to the Caucasus. But I was able to return and, and uh, go out to the North Caucasus down between the Caspian and Black Seas and follow up on a very interesting um, uh, account that uh, Dmitry Pirkulov had investigated, where a long line of tracks, 17-inch tracks, uh, undifferentiable from the uh, uh, from from Sasquatch tracks. Really? Uh, yeah. Pardon? I said really. Really? Yes. I was quite interested in this, and so um, Dimitri, in one of his trips, had had been able to replicate one of the tracks, one of the footprint casts. That is, he learned that there was a second, and so I was able to to get some funding to go over. And uh, and um, uh, accompany him down in the Caucasus. We visited with the gentleman who had the second footprint cast. We were able to replicate it and bring a copy back. Uh, we talked to several witnesses. Uh, dozens of people saw these tracks, and uh, one of them that we visited with it was really quite fascinating. He was a member of of uh, the legislature there. He also was a uh, tour guide. He was an outfitter, a, a guide who would take hikers and trekkers back up into the Caucasus. He had written the authoritative natural history guide for that region. So very, very experienced outdoorsman. Um, And so he was describing his examination of these footprints. I took along with me a little three ring binder, a narrow three ring binder with lots of pictures of Sasquatch tracks from the, uh, from North America, including some that exhibited this remarkable uh, Mid tarsal pressure ridge, the famous, and most famous being the Titmus cast from the Patterson Gimlin film site. Uh-huh. And as he's flipping through, he's recognizing features that he had seen in these tracks. He saw that Titmus cast and he was quite emphatic that yes, he saw footprints that had that very same kind of, of um, a feature. Uh, he saw pictures of half tracks where the foot, uh, the heel is not impressed, but the foot just the forefoot has uh, left an impression. And he said, yes, there was a stretch where it went up a steep bank and just the front half of the foot had impressed, just as was uh, depicted here. Very impressed with, with the experience I had on that trip. What happened in China? Well, China, we were with the documentary group, and uh, so obviously we were somewhat constrained in what we could and couldn't do, and not to mention the fact that uh, we had to have um, uh, escorts the whole time while we were in the Shenajia Park, we had a police escort, very nice guys, and uh, had a very good time with them. 
um, we were only allowed to spend one overnight there. And so, you know, unfortunately, there's only so much you can do in a short period of time. It's just like we were talking about the, uh, the you know, constrained formula of these types of documentaries. But it was great to be able to visit with um, Dr. Zhou Gujing, who has spent, uh, you know, a lot of his career pursuing this question, to meet a witness who, who uh, claimed a sighting and had two footprint casts. And this was the, the most uh, stunning uh, aspect uh, or development on, on this trip was uh, we, I'd been told that this witness had footprint casts that I was going to be privileged to examine. They wouldn't let me look at it until we got out to the site where they were going to actually film us. Uh, but in, as we're riding on the bus to that site, I handed him a reprint of one of my papers that had a nice figure of some 3D scans of that Titmus cast. Upon seeing that, he became very excited. And although he couldn't speak English, he grabs my shirt sleeve and he's thumping his index finger, pointing to this figure and nodding his head. And uh, I, you know, I, I guessed at what he was trying to tell me and said, okay, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at this shortly. Sure enough, he unpacks his case, unwraps these casts, and here are these literally dead ringers for the Patterson Gimlin film site tracks. Huh. They're a little bit wider, but they're almost the same length. That pressure ridge is, is in exactly the same spot with the same configuration. This fellow had no clue about these materials, no clue about my discussion of the significance of that mid-tarsal break. And yet the tracks that he found, which were, were uh, as he described it, along the edge of a spring, where it had apparently squatted down to to drink from the spring. And in so doing, just as you or I would squat and we would be up on the balls of our feet with our heels in the air, um, this thing, because of the mid-tarsal flexibility, heel comes up, but it flexes across the midfoot. The entire forefoot leaves a much deeper impression, pushes up some mud into the hind foot, just in the same fashion as we see here. Impossible um, to fake. It sounds like, I mean, you would know it too, if you saw it, I mean, but impossible to fake. <clears throat> well, you, you never say never. I mean, I wouldn't say use the word impossible, but the likelihood or the, the, the probability that this fellow knew enough about the function of the foot to incorporate these features into this foot in such a remarkably parallel fashion, right. sight unseen of my work and my discussion, my, my, presentations on on this anatomical feature I, I you know he even asked me through the re, through the interpreter he asked me so is there anything like the yaren the chinese wild man uh -huh. is there anything like the yaren in in the united states he didn't even know that we were there because of our interest in sasquatch uh, are you okay <laughs> really did you buy that seriously but yeah this guy lived in a cinder block house with a corrugated tin roof Okay. They have, uh, he had a flat screen TV, however. <laughs> yeah, and a satellite TV, dish. <laughs> the only TV they see is the state state run uh, uh, channels, and you know, they, he might see episodes of Dallas or something like that. But I don't think he's ever seen Monster Quest or Finding Bigfoot. Well, I think they had a Bigfoot on Gilligan's Island once. Oh, so that was okay. okay. Well, that must have been it. So, what if what if one is captured? What do we do? I mean. Now, and I'm assuming if it was, um, you know, a, 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 a park ranger, then the government steps in. But what if, what if, what if, what if one is captured? I mean, what happens? Are we in like the King Kong syndrome? I mean, what, how do we deal with it? And I know you think about this all the time. What, what, how do we handle it? Well, it, it's hard to anticipate. And obviously, uh, the scenario will depend a lot on the circumstances of the procurement of the specimen, whether there's a live capture, whether there's a corpse, whether, whether it's a, someone walks in with a skull, you know, I, I, I certainly hope that we have progressed as a society, you know, but beyond that Victorian scientific ethic of shoot first and ask the scientific questions after you've collected tons and tons of specimens. But, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how it'll play out. Uh, you know, I don't put much stock in conspiracy theories. I, my experiences with with um, 
agency personnel is that any any uh, official denials are motivated more out of embarrassment than out of some covert uh, cover up they just don't want to be associated with a what they see as a as a uh, a mythological tabloid um legendary um uh, phenomenon and uh, nor do they want it, it to appear that government dollars are being spent <laughs> on <laughs> such a, a wild goose chase while while at the same time acknowledging to me that they've seen one or that they found footprints. <laughs> well, you know, obviously you get to say, you know, see, I told you, you know, and, and, you know, put your thumb up to your nose and, and oh, I would never do that. No. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to dance right down in front of Macy's and in, 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 in New York times square and do the dance as you should. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming in. Uh, you, uh just want to, uh, uh, tell everyone out there, we're going to be taking some calls after uh, we say good night. But the good doctor has uh, given us a couple of books. One of them, Autograph, Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, and also uh, one of your field guides. You're going to send uh, one of those out, and I really appreciate you doing that uh, for everybody. Thank you for coming in, and uh, just an amazing conversation. And it wasn't it wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> and uh, so I would love for you to come back on. I have a ton more uh, 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 questions for you, uh, but, uh, you know, we could do a six-hour show on this. And, and I thank you for offering that, by the way. <laughs> I had a great time. Jeff, it was my pleasure. Thank you uh, for coming in. And I just can't say enough. And thanks a lot. Uh, the email is going to come flooding in, and I've just got to deal with it. And it is, uh, you know, it is what it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good <laughs> All right. Good night. I'll call you tomorrow. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Oh, oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. If you are on hold, we've got a lot of calls. Stay with us. We've got a lot of calls backed up. Stay with us. I'll be getting to everybody just uh, in a second here. I want to thank Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum for coming in. Uh, I'm going to have to sleep on this one, but yeah, he did, he did a really good job of uh, convincing me. Yeah, uh, the jury's still out. I gotta I gotta sleep on it. Shoot me an email to Jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com for him to come in and put it all on the line. I've just gotta say it's uh it means a lot to me. And uh what a great guy, what a great conversation. And I, I actually wanna listen to this show again. Uh, shoot me an email to Jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. I've got a lot of email out there. Uh follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio. I'm a little speechless at the moment, and for those of you that know me, that uh, know that I can talk for three straight hours without taking a breath, uh, that was uh, an amazing conversation for me. I've got a bunch of calls stacked up. Let's just jump into the first one. 
Uh, here we go. Uh, you're on the air with Jimmy. Who's calling? What's your name? Hey, my name is Arturo. Can you hear me? Arturo, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing, Jimmy? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm, doing great. Thanks for calling in. Did you listen to uh, The Good Doctor? Yes, actually, uh, I went online and uh, went to YouTube and looked at the Freeman Bigfoot you, uh, video. Kind and, of impressive. And so, what? How did? Uh, well, okay, I know you've got a couple of questions, and uh, you and I've been exchanging email this week and so forth. We'll get we'll get to that in a second. How do you think he did in trying to convince me that there is a Bigfoot? Well, the way I would convince you is if. Uh, the, if, if I showed you, well, if, take it for, for me, if, uh, if I don't have the actual footage or uh, actual pictures or anything like that, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I would just toss it out the, do- you know, out the door because um, any, any picture can be photoshopped or any, anybody can dress up as anything. But I still think the, uh, the Patterson film is, you know, legit. And I, I think now, but the, uh, well, no, you're a paranormal investigator, and uh, and thank you, by the way, for participating in the forums and everything that you have done. But if you're a paranormal investigator and you're out there, you know, chasing down Bigfoot, and you come back with that film, you've got bullets in your gun, don't you? <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> you better believe it, and a machete or something. <laughs> exactly. I mean, because that film is is about as good as it gets for uh, somebody that needs evidence. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's it's really good. So, what's going on, Arturo? How are you, man? I'm doing well. Um, nothing much. I was just uh, analyzing those uh, EVPs that I sent you, and um, I posted them on uh, SoundCloud. I think it's called. Yes, and. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, was piecing it together and listening to it again. And I was, you know, my jaw was dropping because I was starting to hear different, you know, vocals. Yeah, and for everybody that's listening, you go over to jimmychurchradio.com and go into the forums, and Arturo has posted uh, a bunch of his EVPs that he has recorded. Um, and for everybody to listen to and 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 try to extrapolate out of it what he think I've listened to it and and I know that something is there and I think it's actually quite remarkable so and and I had uh, I think I jumped into the forums today and I had said that uh, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the show tonight that I've invited a bunch of paranormal groups from around the country to come in and start participating on on the show and the forums because there's something there, and I want everybody out there that is doing the work that Arturo is to have a to have a place to go, come in, and uh, and let's let's listen to this stuff together. I think it's exciting. How did you how did you get into this? Well, I, I've been doing this uh, for over twenty years. Um, I guess Poltergeist kind of got me into it. Okay, <laughs> in that's movie. yeah, that's yeah, okay. And, uh, but, uh, I, I guess also my, my grandfather died, uh, when I was, I guess, six years old. Uh, I, I don't remember too much, but he, um, passed away, um, in, in the bathroom. But w- what I remember is I saw him in, um, where he always sits and in, in, in a wheelchair and, and then, you know, the next day they found him in, you know, um, in the bathroom, but he, he was. He's been dead for a couple of hours in there, and um, but you know I, I just I just remember seeing him and then waking up and seeing nothing there again, uh, like like he was waving or I don't know what it was, but I don't know if I was dreaming or what. But uh, I felt you know kind of weird, and uh, that then I started uh, listening to um, these I guess I wouldn't say ghost hunters, but people who are interested in the paranormal. Uh huh. And, uh, and then, you know, the movie Poltergeist came out, Ghostbusters came out and, uh, I just started getting more into it. And, um, and later on, uh, a couple of years ago, I met, uh, a group, um, research in paranormal science. And, uh, luckily uh, for me, I, I was able to, uh, become a member, uh, with them because they, um, acknowledged me and, uh, the director, um, Alan Martinez, he, he knew that uh, I also had, you know, something in common with the paranormal. 
So I, you know, uh, I was accepted. And then now we started uh, getting more into the paranormal and, and actually getting more evidence and, um, you know, going to places that we haven't gone before. And, you know, we're just having fun, you know, uh, doing it as a hobby. And um, we're, we're not doing it to get any money. We're not really interested in that or the fame or anything like that. But we, what we want to do is prove to people that there is something out there that uh, it's out of out of the norm. And, you know, for the those people who don't believe, we want to prove them, you know, uh, prove them wrong or right. I don't know how you say that. Do you, do you, <laughs> kind of right, are you ever out on location and goof up and hear something or see something and don't have the camera rolling or you're not, your recorder's not rolling? Oh, no, no. Uh, to tell you the truth, once we get in, well, as for me, I always start recording right away with my uh, camera or my audio. Okay. And, um, we, we never miss out on an opportunity. Okay. Um, there are some cases though, where we do have the, the cameras mounted, you know, and, and they're positioned in one, you know, fixed position. And when, um, like, like, um, my, uh, co uh, my team member, um, Alan Martinez, he walked, um, to another camera and he saw a full bodied apparition, but you know, he saw it with his eyes. So, you know, we couldn't prove that. Uh, so we went, to where that full bodied was and you know we set up cameras there and audio and everything but we didn't capture anything um well, most, you, most of the audio that i mean most of the stuff that we we do get are audio based and um but we're trying to get video do you do it only at night well to tell you the truth it's better at night because um it's a lot more silent and uh, in the daytime there's you know, so much activity going on. There's cars passing by, uh, people talking, you know, all that, all that stuff. When it's at night, it's a lot easier, uh, for us to conduct the experiments, but you know, it, it doesn't matter what time of day it is actually, uh, because, you know, ghosts are all around us. We just, you know, don't, don't see them. They could be right next to you. You just don't know it. And, uh, you know, you don't really have to go to a haunted house or, you know, you know, I had quotations there. Um, it, any place can be haunted. I mean, how many people have died over the centuries, you know? So, well, and do you, when you guys pick uh, a location to go out and do your investigation, is it because somebody has contacted you guys about, you know, some incredibly haunted place or they need you to come out and check out their house? Or are you just going out to, uh, you know, uh, uh, an abandoned insane asylum or prison or just, are you choosing your own locations? How do you guys, how does that happen? How do you guys pick a place? Well, we usually um, go out uh, because we live in the southwest in, in El Paso, Texas. Um, we, you know, this place is, has a whole bunch of history. Um, it used to be called Hell Paso. A lot of people, you know, got murdered here viciously um, in the 1800s. But uh, the, the way we approach it is um, if, if somebody approaches us with, uh, you know, a haunted, you know, at their place or their house is, you know, haunted, um, we, we kind of, uh, don't do houses because sometimes it's just, you know, regular noises. Uh, it could be, you know, your house settling in because, you know, over here, the, the weather changes like dr drastically, like it'd be cold one day and hot the other day. So, you know, the woods can expand, or, you know, uh, so you're going to get that, um, other, other things like that. We, we, we try to take it, um, uh, well, if, if if we can see the fear in their in their eyes and they actually really mean it, then yeah, we'll, we'll go and do it. Okay. Uh, but we also go to you know locations that we think um, are hot spots, like um, you know big buildings, things like that, so we can bring our team members because we have over a dozen so far here in El Paso. Right. Well, tell me a really I, I I'm so fascinated with this, you know, and I watch it all. I watched ghost hunters and I watch ghost adventures and, you know, and international, I watch all the show. I, I love it. Can't get enough mm -hmm. of it. And it always really gets me scared. So tell me a scare. What, just give me one scary story to have for everybody out there. Oof. <laughs> um, well, for me, I guess, uh, gosh, I think, how can I do this? Um, there's been a lot of, of experiences for me. Um, like I said, my grandfather, uh, there was one of those, uh, where 
uh, we know, for me, I haven't encountered anything, you know, creepy, but I, I can recall a story that, um, uh, that really happened, uh, when my grandfather died, um, uh, my brother stayed in the room, uh, which was isolated from the other houses. This was in Mexico. We were vacationing and the house is built like, a like a U, uh, horseshoe type of deal. So he was located on the other end where my grandfather died in that bathroom. And, um, so, you know, you would have to walk all around and get to the other side. And his section was empty. And, you know, when all the lights turned off, it was like pitch black. And he was he was sleeping there and he felt his seat um, rise to the air. And and um, and he tried to, you know, he thought it was just, you know, sleep uh, dreaming. And he saw a figure holding up his seat and lifting in the air. And he, you know, he ran out of there and, and, um, and, you know, called for my mom. And, uh, you know, I was terrified too, because he was yelling at the top of his lungs and, you know, at, at the age of eight years old, you know, what are you going to do? But, uh, that, that instance for me kind of creeped me out because I didn't want to stay in that, you know, little room. But uh, as for a ghost investigation, though, the one that really creeped me out was an audio um, that you know the, the one we captured at the Double Eagle. Uh, yeah, Arturo, that's, Arturo, that's make, one of the ones that. Okay, yeah. um, I've got a bunch of calls coming in. Can you uh, 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 wrap it up really quick? Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah. yeah actually, go ahead. We get into the EVP that we captured at the Double Eagle, but uh, go ahead and answer. answer okay, oh, no, that's okay. I, uh, they're just they're just stacked up now. <laughs> I'm going to jump in <laughs> after the forms tonight. And uh, after the show, and I will talk to you then. Okay. Arturo, you are the best. Everybody, check out Rips and check out what Arturo is doing right now at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Arturo, I'll talk to you after the show. Thank you very much, Jimmy. I appreciate it. All the best. All the best. Bye. Bye. You are on the air. Who's calling? Hello. Hello, you're on the air, live with Jimmy. Hey, how's it going? Uh, uh, this is uh, actually Alan Martinez from uh, Research and Paranormal Science. Oh, okay. <laughs> how are you, Al? We were just talking about you. Yeah, I was, I was trying to get in the airways, and of, of course, like the subject of the paranormal and ghosts are going to be, you know, going to rile everybody up. Well, uh, before we move on, did you, uh, did you listen to uh, Dr. Meldrum tonight? Yeah, I actually did about uh, Bigfoot, and uh, while while I was hearing it, me and Arturo were, were chatting online, and we're kind of you know, going back and forth of, you know, uh, when it comes to the footage of what uh, what he uh, what he was referring to, and we're just kind of like you know, uh, you know, just looking and seeing, you know, uh, since we are paranormal investigators, that doesn't necessarily mean just focus on ghosts. I mean, it has anything to do with that something that's beyond per, uh, normal normality. And Bigfoot kind of, you know, is, you know, within that realm or within that fringe. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's something that interests us as well. But, uh, yeah, it was a very interesting story. And, you know, we looked at the footage and it was pretty interesting. So, Well, you know, the, the doctor uh, came on uh, with um, – and he's a great guy. And we, when I had first contacted him, I had told him then uh, – you know, that I'm a skeptic and he was like, well, let's go. I said, right. okay, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, bring you on the show to argue or for, you know, to paint you in the corner or, or, you know, and demand, I just want to be convinced, you know, I just want to know. I just, right. I, and, and I think he did a really, really good job of that. I think I need to yeah. sleep on it, but, but how are, are you? Uh, have you ever seen, uh, in all of your investigations now you, you guys are down in the Southwest, so not, not too many Bigfoot sightings down there or does it happen often? Uh, not necessarily Bigfoot sightings. I mean, we do live, uh, in the Southwest. There's actually, um, it's very mountainous. Um, and it's, it's, it's the Franklin mountains. That's, that's the basically name of it. And, um, there's supposedly all sorts of, you know, uh, you know, cre- not creatures, but I mean, you know, there's deer sometimes uh, west side of town. Um, they actually did find, a, I'm not even kidding, this is on the news, you can look it up on the internet and everything. 
But uh, they did find a guy living up there in the wilderness, like by himself. He was just like in his briefs or something. I don't know how long he was out there. But uh, yeah, they, I, apparently if he could survive out there uh, for, you know, I don't know how long he was out there for. But I mean, who's to say that, you know, some sort of, you know, Bigfoot creature or Sasquatch or, you know, creature would not be able to, to survive out there as well. So, but uh, not a lot of reports of actual, like, you know, unknown hairy guys. Just usually, usually the guys in the park when it's really hot, because it's Southwest, it's really, really hot playing volleyball. It's kind of like the the extent of the uh, the hairy man sightings in El Paso. So. <laughs> well, how long have you been uh, heading up rips? Um, I I was actually a part of another paranormal group. Uh, I would say maybe five, six years ago. And uh, it didn't really, you know, the, the direction of the group really wasn't going too strong. So um, in 2010 is when it kind of, that group started kind of going south. And um, I was just like, you know what, let's just, I'm just going to buy the name Research in Paranormal Science. And I just kind of keep it in my back pocket, see what happens. And yeah, ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately that group kind of, you know, went, went south. And I'm like, I'm going to just spearhead with, with rips. And uh, it was September of 2010, and we haven't really stopped since, basically. So, well, the uh, wave we of few, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, the wave of uh, the ghost hunter shows kind of started, you know, 2008, 2009. Is uh, were you doing it before that, or did that help inspire you? Well, actually, just like uh, Art was mentioning earlier, uh, the movie Poltergeist and Ghostbusters were and and Scooby Doo. <laughs> probably were, were, were my main reason as, as a kid. But then, um, and it always fascinated me when I was a kid. And then when ghost hunters uh, initially came on and I was like, Oh wow. Like people actually do this. Like people are actually ghostbusters. Like they're like for real, you know? So I guess all the movies and, you know, just kind of like fiction and nonfiction when it comes to ghost hunters right. is what actually inspired me. And I'd be like, you know what? Hey, if they could do it. then like, why can't I do it locally? You know? So, that's kind of, you know, it, it was all a mesh. But, uh, yeah, like, Ghost Hunters definitely inspired me to be like, hey, they can do it, so I can I, I, I. So can I, you know? How do you guys equip yourselves? Do you have all of the same gear that Zach Bagans has? Uh, you know, and how do you fund it? How, how, do, you guys, how do you guys operate? It's an out-of-pocket uh, organization. Um, we're not um, in a nonprofit organization. Excuse me, uh, we don't have that status. Um, it's actually pretty expensive to be a nonprofit, right? But uh, everything's out of pocket. I mean, basically, I mean, we, you know, it's um, we're all just uh, cotton dry. We're all just a bunch of nerd geeks that just want to experience ghosts. And uh, to answer your question, yeah, we have uh, some of the uh, just kind of like the um, same equipment that you know you see on ghost hunters, you see on uh, ghost adventures and stuff like that. You know, it's it's kind of like you know you your tools like it's kind of standard tools but at the same time um we don't like limiting limiting ourselves to just those tools i mean we, we also like to uh uh like arturo mentioned earlier like experiment you know um you know like it's not necessary like oh we, we didn't get any results with these tools and there's it's not haunted right well, of course i mean that's just part that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to like, trying to get evidence i mean We've tried uh, hide and go seek in the dark. We've tried uh, the dousing rod. We've tried all sorts of other experimental stuff with magnets and uh, electrons and stuff. I mean, you kind of have to think outside the box. Um, you know, ghost hunting is a fringe science, but I mean, that doesn't stop us from like trying to look, you know, further than like what are the standard tools of what TV is showing us. You know what I mean? We try to think outside the box and we try to kind of, you know, come up with something different or come up with something and, and so far, I mean, from, from part of our experiences, we've actually had a lot of luck uh, with it. So, Do you feel when, you, when you're getting ready to record an EVP, that second right before, I mean, can you tell something is in the room? I mean, is there a sense of what's about to happen? Um, the thing is, what's funny is that none of us really claim, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, we're, you know, sensitive or uh, clairvoyant or whatever. Uh, none of us, you know, I could, you know, how can I say this? Really claim that there's only, there's only one person, um, in, uh, Ceci that she, she, uh, she is actually clairvoyant and she's been, uh, I guess tested and she automatically, I mean, she, 
issues. It's very, it's very evident to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, for the rest of us, um, if you know, since we don't really consider ourselves like sensitive or clairvoyant, uh, it does take, I, I guess, like a little bit more. Uh, our threshold is a little thicker. Um, but the thing is that I mean, sometimes it's it's so heavy. I mean, like you were mentioning earlier, there's like an atmosphere change, and not just like oh, there's a cold spot. It's not it's not just about that. I mean, right. I mean, you could kind of sense it. You could. I mean, you, we look at each other, and be like, whoa, and then we have that kind of like eye eye connection. You're just like you know, like conversation in like each other's head. You're just like, you felt that, right? You're like, yeah, I totally felt that. It was one of, it's one of those, it, it even seems comedic at times because we're just looking at each other. You're like, and we're not even talking. We're just like talking at the same time. We're like, you felt that, right? Oh yeah, totally. Blah, blah, blah. And it has nothing to do with cold or temperature or anything. It's just like this atmosphere change. And it's, it doesn't happen often uh, or as often as like the both shows make it seem. Right. But yeah, there's been, there's been several times where we're just like, Whoa, wow. Whoa, whoa, what was that? Do you, do, do you um, ever get scared? I mean, do you ever get like freaked out, like freaked out and have to get well, out of there um, kind of thing? Can you repeat the last part? I'm sorry. Uh, and where you have to get out of there. <laughs> you know? I just heard something. Well, man. Actually, I'm out of here. You know, that well, <laughs> that's fine but you know what and the thing is like we actually get this asked a lot you're like oh aren't you scared of doing this it's like well i mean and i'm all like well it no well we don't we're kind of like, like don't have to man we're kind of like forced not to be scared but at the same time like we're there because we want to be you know what i mean we're there for the thrill we're there for the adrenaline um do we walk like down dark corridors absolutely um are we hesitant no, we're not because, like I said, it's like getting a tattoo. I don't know if uh, that's probably like the best uh, example I use or like most frequent one. It's like you know you're there and sitting in a chair. You know some guys like cutting into you, like you know putting ink inside you, and it's very painful. I've had several, so I should know. And but you can't really complain because you're there because you want to be. You know what I mean? Like if you're there and you're getting you know freaked out and like oh my god and you're running away, then like you're not really there for the right reasons, you know? We do get startled every once in a while because, I mean, stuff happens and it's unexpected. But, I mean, to say that, like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't know if I should go in there. And you said, well, then go home then because we're here because we want to capture evidence of the paranormal. It's not like, you know, we trick people into saying, oh, we're going to go to dinner and be like, oh, by the way. Right, 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 right. Well, are you... are you? It's not scary to say. Are you convinced that uh, there are ghosts? Yeah, I've honestly, throughout the years that I've been doing this, there's way too much stuff to say that there isn't. Um, like yourself, I actually am a big time uh, skeptic as well. Um, we get on, on our Facebook, we're, you know, we're always getting messages, we're always getting pictures of orbs, You're like, oh, what do you think this is? And I'm just like, dust. And they're like, well, what do you, what do you mean? It's cause like, it could be like my cousin that, and I'm just like, it may, maybe like, I don't know, but it looks like a dust particle to me, you know, it's like, um, and I, I, I may come up, I may come off like, uh, you know, um, like satirical about it and sarcastic about it, but it's just like, I mean, you have to, I mean, in order for me to be like, whoa, that's actually really cool. I mean, it's, it, it kind of takes a little while or it has to be something kind of, you know, spectacular in order for me to be like, Hey, wow. You know what? This is actually really cool. Cause most of the time I'm, you know, I'm, I'm totally skeptic. I'm a total skeptic. Whenever anything happens during the investigation, um, I mean, I'm pretty logical. I'm just like, Oh, well that was like, you know, uh, the ice machine or that was the air conditioning kick on, or that was, uh, you know, the pipe of the heater or something, you know, rattling or something. But I mean, at the same time, I mean, it, 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 um, there's like way too many things for me to, that I experienced myself that I've heard, you know, we've gotten, you know, plenty of EVPs, uh, class A, not just like, oh, you know, it could be this, could be that, you know, I was just, I don't know if uh, Art showed you our previous investigations, but there's some things that are just like totally undeniable, like things like, I mean, no one's in the room for like, you know, 30, 40 minutes, and then you hear a little girl, like say something clear as day. 
and then there's nothing else for the next 20 minutes, and then you can hear us come in. Okay, this is us coming into the building. Well, well, just, well explain. Makes, like, absolutely no sense. Right, right. Well, explain. Take me through something like that for a second. Uh, what, what I have a hard time understanding, um, it, not only in those TV shows, I haven't gone on any investigations myself. I would like to. I would enjoy doing it. But oh, yeah. do do you actually when you you know see somebody with taps or you know ghost hunters or Zach Bagans or any of those cats um, right. when you hear them go hey did you hear that I heard a little girl or you know hey did you hear that voice are are you actually hearing a voice I've never heard of I've never had I've never had a voice whisper to me in the dark so. Or sing, right. or or so it hasn't happened to me. But so when you're out there investigating, do you actually hear the voice, or do you have to, or have you? We we have because the thing is that it's because uh, there's a lot there's a, a, a hold on a second there's a there's two different I guess kind of EVPs. There's there's something called disembodied voice, and there's an EP which is electronic voice phenomenon. Uh, a disembodied voice is basically is heard at the time it's captured, and that's when, I mean, like you, you were saying about the ghost shows, we're like, oh wait, did you hear that? Oh, I saw, I heard a little girl. Sometimes it does happen. Um, given, uh, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, circumstances and a lot of variables that have to happen, or in order for that to happen, to be able to for them to manifest enough to actually have like an audible voice. Right. It does happen. We have heard it at the time, and we're like, whoa, 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 chill out. Did you hear that? Oh, no, it was weird. Or there's some time where, and which is basically most of the time, where, I mean, we're just talking. It's, you know, me, let's just say me and Art or one of the other investigators, and we're just talking, hey, man, uh, did you watch the game last night? Oh, yeah. What, just regular talking. We're not even talking about anything. And it's just two people in the room. And there's a third voice that comes in, like chiming in to our conversation, and then and the thing is that we're totally oblivious to it, uh, and the conversation just kind of keeps going, and you know we don't capture it until after the fact of like, whoa, 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 hold on, it was just you two in the room, like hold on, let me, oh yeah, man, it was just me and Danny, and we we're just in this room, and I was like, who's the third guy? What do you mean? What third guy? It was just us two. Oh well, check this out, man. He's talking about the game too, and you know, like I'm saying, it's EVPs. There's two different things: disembodied voice and EVPs. And it's, you know, we don't really. Some some of the times we hear it at the time, and but most of the time we, we capture them like after the fact, after the, after we've already, you know, we're going through evidence, analyzing it. So, I would love to hear some of uh, your guys's other stuff, and if you if you do ever get a chance to. Well, I, you will, but uh, post it up this week on the forums, and uh, you guys have been doing a really good job with that. But I would like to hear, um, you know, some some of your best stuff. You have mentioned earlier that you know you had a a, a child's voice. Did you get that on? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Th this was actually, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like right currently, it's actually the uh, fire department headquarter building. Um, it, there's no fire trucks in there. It's just basically, you know, the secretary, all the, the pencil pushers, <laughs> right. all the offices. And, um, and it's, it was exactly what I just finished, you know, talking to about earlier about, you know, us being oblivious to it. Um, and, and I'll, I'll definitely go ahead and email you that, that particular, um, that particular, uh, EVP, but it was a little girl. Um, there was no little girls we have little girls <laughs> in our investigations that are like, seven or eight years old, uh, obviously. I mean, we, we kind of, uh, we do have guest investigators, but we kind of require them to be 18 or older, um, so on and so forth. But I mean, anyway, I'm kind of getting off the subject. Um, at the time the CVP was, was captured, um, it was in uh, Command Central, which is where we set up our, you know, um, video surveillance. We have the monitor and we kind of, that's kind of like, you know, the headquarters. And um, we were, you know, checking and, and Art, like he was mentioning earlier, he just, as soon as he was a building, he just hits record, regardless if we're setting up, regardless if we're, you know, let down the rules or anything. Uh, and he was setting stuff up and he was like, you know, checking the voice recorders and he goes, oh, I think this one's broken. Oh, there's no batteries in this one or something. And he just kind of keeps on going, um, you know, with his home conversation or he was talking to somebody else. And underneath him, I mean, it's, it's clear as day, 
we kind of needed to amp, you know, uh, amp up the volume a little bit. But I mean, it's uh, it's kind of like undeniable. There's a little girl that I don't know if you want to, because uh, I, I usually don't like, you know, saying, oh, this is what the EDP says, because it'll already kind of giving you, a, you know, what you're going to hear type thing. Well, but, I mean, uh, it's either obvious or it isn't. I mean, so what did you hear? Well, we went back and forth, um, myself and Art, because uh, he had some, like, you know, uh, what's it called, uh, equipment to, like, clean it up and take up his and this and that. So we're just going back and forth. I hear this, I hear this. So then finally, we just kind of come to a consensus and we're just like, dude, this is what I hear. Um, and it's it's a little girl that says, can you help me, please? If you leave, can you help me to leave? And it's, like, clear as wow. day. And, I mean, it was actually really sad because, I mean, um, what this building used to be, it used to be the old train depot. So, I mean, you know, maybe she was asking us, Hey guys, like I could see you. Like, you know, if you leave, can you take me with you? Cause I'm lost. Or did you, you know, hear she was confusing us with her mom or something? I mean, it's, right. It's, right. It's kind of, yeah. Did you hear the voice? Uh, it, it was, was it disembodied? Was it a voice that you heard or did you have to go back and listen to it later in the EVP? It was it was an actual EVP because like I was like I was mentioning uh, like Art was just going about his business you know talking about the quarters being uh, I think this one needs need some batteries hey these you know just kind of going through this you know just kind of going through inventory of all our equipment and if he would have heard that I mean he would have been like whoa hey did you guys hear that or you know he would have mentioned something you know right um so I wasn't excuse me I wasn't there at the time this was recorded I was in another part of the building. But I mean, I even asked him, like, well, did you hear that? And he was like, no, no, man. Like, I, I was just going through the stuff. I was just going through all the equipment. I didn't hear this till like I was, you know, going over the evidence. So it wasn't, it, in this case, it wasn't a, a disembodied voice. It was an actual uh, EVP that we caught. Wow. I mean, and it, it's the children for me, for me. It's the, the, right. the, it's the children's voices when I hear any of that stuff. Uh, you know, crying, laughing, talking. It's, it's it's always the children's voices that affects me the most. Yeah, they're, they're, they're probably the creepiest. So, I mean, not, not, not to take away anything. I mean, like I said, it, it was really sad to hear that. But, I mean, they're, I mean it's pretty creepy too, man, because you're just like, ah, I don't know, maybe I guess like Hollywood kind of, you know, well, uh, but know, that's exactly that like creepy kids. Sure. I, I, part of the investigating is, is to go out there and prove that this stuff is going on. Okay. And that there is an afterlife and there's another side. There's all of that, but let's face it. Right. The other part is it's cool because it's creepy. You know, that's well, why, yeah, you like know, said, it's the I mean, thrill. It's an, it's an adrenaline rush, you know, like not a lot of people can say, Hey man, what do you do as a hobby? Oh, I collect, you know, cars and I, you know, make little model airplanes. Cool. That's awesome. Hey, what do you do? Oh, well, I go golfing. Uh, cool. And that's, you know, when it's sort of like, Hey, what do you do? I hunt boats and get freaked out and, you know, get the adrenaline p- pumping and right. it's not an everyday thing, you know, it's like, they're like, Whoa, Whoa, what's the side of them? It sticks out like a sore thumb, you know? <laughs> that's exactly so, uh, it. I mean, yeah. It's fine. Well, Art, I'm going to get to some other phone calls. Do me a favor and uh, post the little girl stuff online. I would absolutely love to hear it. Okay, so uh, take care of that, and I will jump in tonight after the forum or after the show, and I will be on the forums tonight, and we'll hang out. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jimmy. Art, man, keep up the good fight. All right. Thank you, sir. I'll talk to you soon. Uh, bye. Bye. This is Fade to Black. That opens the phone lines, 323-825-5045. Give me a call. I'll be back right after this. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? My name's Brian Taylor, ninja badass extraordinaire, and this is JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hey, J-C-R, in your face. JimmyChurchRadio.com On the Dark Matter Radio Network. (laughs) 
All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to Black, I am your host, Jimmy Church. That opens the phone lines, 323-825-5045. I want to hear from everybody. I would like to talk some Bigfoot tonight. And uh, again, 825, 323-825-5045. Shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio. Okay, man, I have got a bunch of stuff going on right now. And uh, okay, I may have to take another break. I've got a bunch of calls lined up, and I've got to stack this stuff up. But I'm going to give away a couple of books tonight. Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, signed by Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. Also his field guide. He signed one of those for us. You want to call in and talk some Bigfoot? Whatever. But if you want to call in, we're giving those away. Also, I got some really cool DVDs last night of uh, some stuff. And I'm going to be giving some of those away, too. So, again, 323-825-5045 is the number. Okay. So uh, I wanted to talk. I'm going to take a little quick uh, break. But uh, earlier this week, uh, there was an article that came out by Robert Nemiroff and Teresa Wilson from uh, Michigan Technical University uh, from their physics department. And they wrote about, and I think the link is still up at jimmychurchradio.com. And if it's not, uh, I'll have the producers uh, post up the article. But how they were trying to chase down time travelers on the internet. And I reached out to them again this week. I'm going to be putting together uh, a time travel show. And I'm going to get them on. Okay. They've responded back. They're a little bit busy, part, partly because this article that they wrote, I don't think that they expected uh, for it to cause as many ripples out there as, as it did, but it did. But uh, I'm going to get them on, and I've got a couple of other guests lined up, and I want to I want to find out where we are today. Honestly, where are we today with time travel? It's a subject that I find so fascinating. I went and uh, listened to, and if you're not hip to this guy, you should check him out. He's pretty fascinating. His name is Bashar, and uh, or that's the that's the uh how do i say this that's the being that is being uh channeled through uh, uh i'll uh, get his information later it doesn't matter but go watch the bashar videos and there's a couple of bashar time travel videos out there so i was listening to that too and i need to I want to take some of this information and some of my thought that I've been putting into this for so many years, and and I'm going to talk to a couple of physicists, and I'll get Nemiroff in here, and I've got a couple of other friends over here at Caltech, and uh, maybe even uh, Michio Kaku, and I'll reach out to him too as well. And I'm going to put together a time travel show, as well as I've reached out to Darby over at the Time Travel Institute. I'm waiting for him to... Uh, to check his schedule as well, but to put all of this together, because I just want some answers on where are we today? I've had so much email and everybody out there, as I speak and, and talk about this right now, you know who you are and thank you for all of the email and everybody has a different view on this subject. Why? Because we don't really know, do we? And neither do I. I've got my theories like everybody else does. And when you go and you listen to, you know, a guy, you know, like Ron Mallet, Ronald Mallet, you listen to him or you listen to Kaku or you go on the Time Travel Institute and go read some of those forums or you check out John Teeter and go check that out or um, uh, Bashar and some of this other stuff that is out there that is way left or way right. And you listen to that. To me, it's all just as valid as the next guy. And that's, that's, I just, I need to, to get a bunch of people together and I'm working on it now where we have just, uh, 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 a panel and, and, and where we can just all 
question each other and see if we can come up with something. And I'm putting that show together now, and it should be fascinating. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, before I take this break, uh, we are going to be going live. Uh, We started setting this up this week. And so here in Los Angeles, we are actually going to take the show and uh, we are going to go live in front of a studio audience. And we've got a couple of guests lined up now, and uh, we should be doing this very soon. Uh, I will announce the location uh, in a couple of weeks. We've got, uh, well, we've got it pretty much set up now. But if it keeps growing like it is, we're going to actually have to go to a larger venue. But uh, we're going to we're going to go live and take it on the road and it's going to be great. And hopefully we'll have, you know, three, four, 500 people live studio audience with, uh, some really cool guests and you'll be able to just come and hang out for three hours while we broadcast live somewhere here in Los Angeles. And I'm telling you what, I'm so excited about being able to go in front of, uh, everybody, friends, meet everybody, and uh, take this live where we can actually just hang out together. And I'm really excited about that. So that announcement will be coming in uh, uh, at the end of the week next week, and we'll uh, we'll lay that out there. Okay, so right now I'm going to take a little break. i got a couple things we're going to do really quick, and when I come back, I will be taking your calls. Don't forget, this is Fade to Black. This is Jimmy Church. On the Dark Matter Radio Network, KJCR. Got a lot of email to read here, too. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. Don't touch that mouse. Fade to black. We'll be back in a second. This is William from La Crescenta, and I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Jimmy Church. My name is Alan, and I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. He's always giving it to you straight. JimmyChurchRadio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Jimmy Church Radio. The The Revolution. Revolution. All right, everybody, welcome back. KJCR, JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'm just going through all of this email. All right. It says KJCR, JimmyChurchRadio.com. I am your host, Jimmy Church. The lines are open. 323-825-5045. Taking your calls. Giving away a few things, too, by the way. So the first person that calls, I will give an autographed Sasquatch legend meets science signed by Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, 323-825-5045. All right. And uh, shoot me an email to Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is Fade to Black. And uh, I was talking earlier this week. I did a bunch of stuff. Uh, I went to a, a Ciro meeting last week, and last night I went to a UPARS meeting. And uh, hanging out last night with uh, Nadine Lalich, and she was on the show on Friday. And I went out last night, and she gave one of the most stunning uh, talks. Now, she was a lot of fun here on the show. I just enjoyed, and I have compassion for what she's been going through. But uh, And it was a great conversation, and you can go and listen to the show. It is up on YouTube. But um, going to this uh, UPARS meeting last night, UPARS LA, and listening to her speak, it was a different experience for me. And I'm sitting there and meeting everybody at the, it, it was great and talking. But for everybody there, when you listen to the things that she had to say uh, and the way that, uh, 
how, I, I want to say this correctly, the way that she was received and the questions that everybody had for her, I think that um, there's uh, a lot of people that share her experience. And unless you go out to something like that, and I would encourage anybody to go and listen to not only Nadine speak, um, and if and if she is speaking uh, near you, to go and, and listen to her, but to go and understand and hang out with other people that share these concerns because it is a big deal. And I was out last night and just speaking with everybody uh, about this, I was shocked. And it's not that I was shocked that uh, this is going on. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I mean is not enough people are talking about it. And when, you know, you have Nadine up there and people like her that are up there speaking like this and and putting it all out there on the line, why isn't more uh, coverage uh, being, you know, out there on this? I don't understand. So uh, I just wanted to get out there. I've got a bunch of calls coming in. Let me start to grab them, and uh, let's see what's going on. Sorry. Uh, thanks for waiting, and uh, let's see, see who we have here first. Okay, you are on the air. Who's calling? Hey, this is Jeff Cullen. The Jeff Cullen? Yes, sir. <laughs> How are you, Jeff? Very well, thank you. Am I speaking to the Jimmy Church? <laughs> Yes, you are, Jeff. Uh, for everybody out there, Jeff is, uh, oh, my goodness. Well, before I tell everybody how long we've known each other, probably 25 years, why are you calling, Jeff? <laughs> well, I've just found the show. Um, aside from finding it and listening to it for the first time and listening to you do your magic, uh, the fascination of all of the subjects that have been covered tonight have just been something I've lived with uh, my entire life, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for everybody out there, now that they've heard me say your name, Jeff is uh, uh, a guitar player that that I've uh, been jealous of. You know, I've never admitted that to you, by the way, but uh, jealous of for, for a number of years. He's, he's a real player, but not only that, um, and well respected here in Hollywood and Los Angeles as a guitar player, but you're you're a musician's musician as well. And I remember you and I in the studio a number of years ago when uh, when we were mixing uh, one of your songs, and the just the 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 complexity of the songs and and how well it's written. You know, you're just more more of a guitar. I mean, more than a guitar player. But everybody knows you as the good-looking guy that can shred. So, uh, but, <laughs> well, in fact, you just jogged my memory. I think that was um, that was a song called "So Lonely." That's right. And, that's um, right. That's right. With the you orchestra, were, uh, yeah, fervently mixing that with me. And I remember you were working with Neil Diamond at that time. Yes, I, I was. Well, well, no, yeah, Neil's. Uh, yeah, Neil and his uh, uh, his son. Wow, you do have a good memory. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because that was. <laughs> Let's stretch that back. That was probably 1995. Exactly. Yeah, 1995. That's, that's almost 20 years ago. And yeah. by that time, we'd already known each other for probably almost 10 years, seven years. So, yeah. Yeah. okay. So um, now a, a man of your stature calling in a show uh, like this, what's going on? Well, um, not to deviate from what we've been, you know, discussing tonight i'd like to first start off by saying sasquatch and bigfoot has always been something that i've met with a bone of contention in terms of whether i really do believe uh in that or not but you know it just seems that there's a lot of um of evidence that can't just be overlooked meaning you know, there's got to be some you know there's got to be something to it i mean i'm sure there's got to be one out of all of those footprints or all of that evidence or all of those discoveries that there's got to be something behind all that. Have you, um, uh, now you're from England or, or Ireland or England or yeah, both I'm Irish, but I was brought up in the UK in the, the posh boarding school, UK style of upbringing. <laughs> uh, uh, no big, no big feet over in, uh, in, uh, Great Britain. 
Say, say what? I said no big feet in, in Great Britain. No, 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 no big foot in the UK. Not that I would. But when I was in boarding school, though, uh, we did sneak out a very old friend, uh, Martin Dilworth, if he's out there somewhere in in the you know in, in the airwaves listening, who knows? But uh, if he if he's out there, please, Martin Dilworth, make contact with Mr. Jimmy Church. Well, you know, we have story to verify what I'm about to tell you. Oh, we have a huge but, uh, we snuck out after after uh, <laughs> after hours. After, okay, you know, ten o'clock bed down. You know, this was in the boarding school out in the middle of the Kent English countryside, in forests and that whole thing. And we we were literally plodding through a forest when all of a sudden out of nowhere comes and, and I'm talking enormous and I'm, you know, uh, I'm not exaggerating. Like I can't even explain to you how big this thing was. It was a triangular shape with a light on each corner. And uh, as it, it was literally feet above the treetops and it, it when it was, Dead silent. Not a not a sound did this thing make. How and, how uh, far away, Jeff? I'll never how, forget it. I'll never ever forget well, it. Well, how far away was it when you first saw it? Uh, a mile, a half mile? Was it feet? It it actually caught us completely off guard because you know when you you can imagine you're in a, a forest and uh, we were we were walking up a trail and we looked to our left because it didn't make a sound. And we noticed it coming, coming toward us, like the size of, uh, you know, bigger than a, if you can imagine, bigger than a jumbo jet, but a, a triangular shape, complete triangular shape. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we, were, we were just like dumbstruck. And we're talking about maybe it, if you could look at it in terms of football fields, it came up on us about two to three football fields away. So it's right there. It's right, right in oh, front yeah. of you. It, came right up on us because it was completely quiet, you know? Right. We're out in the middle of the forest, you know, two, two, you know, young kids just, you know, up to no good. But then all of a sudden, you know, this thing comes right up on us and then literally passes over us. And it was one corner of the triangle that kind of went over us. Uh And as soon as that came over us, you know, and I've, I've played, you know, live rock shows with walls of amps behind me pretty much most of my life. Right. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not known as a quiet guitar player. No, you are not. <laughs> but I'm not exaggerating. It is the loudest thing I've heard in my life. So you're saying that when you first saw it, you heard nothing, and now nothing. it's flying over you, and, and then it just over... T- and for you to, for you to tell me... It's the loudest thing you ever heard. That's that's frightening in itself, <laughs> because uh, you know what loud is. Um, so I, I, and you know what, I've never, I've never heard a description quite like that. Almost everybody says uh, the same thing that it was dead quiet. Even the things that I've experienced. So for dead you, quiet, but I'm telling you, just when it went over us, right? The, the, when you, it was only, it only passed over us about. I'd say 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and it was gone. Right. Over us. Right, right. But in those two, three seconds, man, I will never forget it as long as I live. So what, what, <laughs> when, <laughs> when you say, oh, what did you hear? I, I understand you say it's loud. What did it sound like? Was it like thunder? Was it like jet engines? Was it like rocket engines? Was it like a train, a tornado? What, what, what did it sound like? Man, it was... It was, you know, okay, there, there is, let, let's look at volume in terms of, like, bass and in terms of, uh, you know, like a high-pitched shrill sound, you know, let's look at it like, and then you've got, like, a jet engine kind of sound right right in between. Let's look uh-huh. at it kind of like that, you know? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So you've got that thunder, you know, that, that sub, subwoofer kind of sound? Uh-huh. Then you've got that middle kind of sound where there's a jet engine that's, you know, kind of you know, like five to seven K I'm a musician. So that kind of makes a lot of sense to some of us, but then you got that 10 to 15 K that real high pitched, um, you know, how could I, shrill, how can shrill. I explain it? Just a shrill, you know, right on the top, you know, yeah. and this thing combined all of that, except less of the subwoof. It was more like a, um, 
not a screaming sound, but something that um, that is so overwhelming and just mind blowingly like loud that um, I my hearing was affected all day the next day. Did you see any type of engines or anything, or was the sound like emanating from everywhere? Nothing. Wow. Nothing. It was a black triangle, and you know, I, you know, I think in terms of like the stealth bomber or something like that. You know, oh, maybe they were working on, you know, on a stealth, you know, pre stealth, you know, whatever. Right. But this thing was so huge, Jimmy. It was the size of I'd say two to three jumbo jets. It was freaking enormous, and it was frick- And the way it went over the trees was the part that I'll also never forget. It was like it would go right over the tops of the trees, like, and then go up and down, and then up and down. Like I remember it coming over, like, and we we were on um, we were on a like a, a ridge, a ledge, that kind of d- dumped down into kind of a you know like a six feet, eight feet, like a like a stone wall that kind of was down below where we were where we were walking. Right. And that thing went over us. Uh, Dilworth covered his ears first and dove off the wall and crouched down in, in the ground. I followed him because it was terrifying, man. It scared the bejesus out of us. <laughs> oh, All right. If you're on the line, if you're calling in, stay there. I'll be grabbing your call uh, in just a second. Hey, Jeff, thanks for uh, thanks for calling in, man. You're out of the country, so you're back, and I can uh, uh, get in touch with you tomorrow. Absolutely, man. Love the show. I'm dying to listen to more and more of it. Thanks for having me on. Seriously, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for calling in. I'll call you tomorrow. Welcome back. Rock and roll. You got it. Thanks, Jeff. You're on the air with Jimmy. Who's calling? Hey, Jimmy, this is Randy Cole calling you again. How are you? Randy Cole. Hey, how are you? Uh, from, From the Great White North? Uh, yep, I'm calling you from Alaska tonight. Yeah. Uh, really? How are you, Randy? Yeah. I'm doing good, doing good. Before yeah. I ask last you the out, uh, last time I talked to you, I was in Vancouver. So that's right, that's um, right. And yeah. um, uh, uh, before I ask the obvious, you know, are you staying warm? Um, hey, you know what's funny? What I'm going to ask you in a second what you're doing up there because I would love to know why you're in Alaska. But we, this show and the website in general uh, reaches around the world. And this is what's funny. I can monitor every single day what countries we're listening, what cities. Um, and we've covered most of, uh, uh, most of the world. But the funny thing is we had every state in the United States except for Alaska. And I, yeah, yeah. What's funny is I can't force the issue, you know, you're going to listen to the show where you're listening to the show from and call in where you're calling in from. I can monitor all of that. And I know what city and area codes and zip code I, 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 and it's fun to watch and monitor that. But for me not to have all 50 States, you know, I've, I've got just, I've got every, you know, every area in Canada is covered and Wales and England and Europe and Africa and, you know, China. No North Korea yet, though, by the way. <laughs> but no Alaska until a couple of days ago. And so and now you're up there. So there you go. So what are you doing up there in Alaska? Actually, this is where I work at. Uh, I live in Washington State and travel up here. I'm what you refer to as a sloper. So I come up here for a minimum of two weeks at a time and work 12-hour shifts, 12-hour or 12-hour shifts, seven days a week. Uh, basically, a contractor for some of the large oil companies on the North Slope. Ah, oh, oh by the way, um, after your phone call and your description of everything, I got probably ten emails about you. From people that remembered you calling in uh, to that other show, <laughs> and um, and fascinated with everything back then, and and they were just like, man, I, re- I remember that, and it was it was funny. Um, uh, I've had a lot of e- you know, you get a lot of email here at the show, uh, but you specifically, wow, you've got your uh, you've got your fans out there, Randy. 
Well, I, I did make friends with a lot of the guys at that other site and, or the, uh, you know, the other show. And I keep in contact with them constantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of my favorite people. <laughs> well, you've but, left your, uh, the reason I, I have no problem talking about it is because I'm one. I actually, I would like to find other people that have experienced that. Cause just like you said, um, shoot, you know, you've never heard of it like before either. Right. And, um, yeah, matter of fact, today I just got an email from the other officer. Uh, but oh, you did. What was his name, John? What was his name? John. Yeah. John. John. Yep. Yep. Oh. Um, and uh, so I'm going to be talking to him a little bit. I'm going to try to encourage him to do some shows too, and uh, you know, see if we can maybe get some answers. Somebody would pop up and say, "Well, the reason you know this is what we believe." So, right. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, in... the reason I called you. Oh, sure. No. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, the reason I was going to call you tonight is uh, I've been waiting for this guy to come on your show. Uh, I've seen him on TV, listened to him, you know, and um, I, I always find him very fascinating. And uh, once again, you prove that your show is really quite diverse and, and very remarkable and really enjoyable. But I wanted to mention that when I was about 14 years old, I got to meet and shake hands with Roger Patterson. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it was uh, after he had, uh, you know, uh, had after it became public knowledge about the uh, the movie that he had shot in California, um, he took that that movie on tour throughout the country, trying to earn money, you know, and uh, whatnot. And he gave a heck of a presentation with it. And he showed up in my hometown of Libby, Montana, and I paid the fee and went to the show at a school about four blocks from my house and sat through it. And I stayed after and shook his hand, and then I remember running home as fast as I possibly could. And because uh, the thing that scared me about that thing, and, and that that I remember the most, is uh, he had uh, a lot of uh, sound bites of alleged uh, Sasquatch screaming in the woods and whatnot, howling, and uh, it was terrifying. To be honest with you, for a fourteen-year-old kid, and I have never ran that fast since. I have, honestly. Well, is the, so, but you, you kind of, uh, stir memories in me too, because I remember, uh, I lived in Chicago at that. I think I was in, well, the film was shot in 60s. Yeah, I was, no, I was in Europe, but, uh, and I was very young, but I remember probably around 68 or 69, I saw the Patterson film on TV. And I can't remember the context the context of it, if it was a documentary, if it was uh, the news. Um, I, I can't remember. But I, what I do remember was everybody talking about it uh, leading up to it's going to be Bigfoot's going to be on TV tonight. That, that film, that film is going to be on TV. And I was probably uh, at that time, I was probably seven, eight, nine years old. But when I saw that film, and they showed it over and over and over, if I, for some reason, I remember them playing sounds, too. I, 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 um, it's funny that you say that. But it yeah. freaked me out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was terrified. I totally remember that. So I can understand. Uh, you probably ran straight home. It's uh, yep. you know, like the the first time you saw the movie Jaws. You didn't exactly go jump in your swimming pool in the backyard, you know. After I didn't even water my yard for three days. Yeah, yeah I understand that one. Too. Exactly. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes because the show's at the end. And um, but tell me more about was there a lot of people there? What was the reaction like with everybody else? Do you remember exactly uh, how everybody felt after seeing that uh, film? You know, uh, being 14 years old, and I think I was probably one of the youngest people there, as I recall. So I didn't get to intermix with anybody. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I, when I left, I, I stuck around, shook the guy's hand, but he impressed people because a lot of people, I remember, were standing in line wanting to shake his hand and, you know, and say hi to him. Um, but And I don't remember how big the, the turnout was. I remember I was sitting fairly close to the front. Right. But, you know all school, I bet you there was probably maybe not more than 30 or 40 people there, which actually for Libby was not a bad turnout. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, uh, back then, he wasn't carrying videotape around with him. This guy actually had reels of film, and so it was a projector in a school, right? Film, correct? Wow, that, exactly. it, that must have been... That's a once-in-a-lifetime experience right there, and I have never... 
uh, I've never had anybody tell me that they saw, the, you know, uh, let alone meet Patterson, but uh, go to one of those presentations. That's uh, remarkable. It's something you've never forgotten, I'm sure. Uh, oh, no, not at all. It's, uh, it was pretty cool. It was, uh, I, and every time I see the film, I think, oh, you know, shoot, I met that guy. He shook his hand. Right. So, well, uh, was our, uh, well, here's the obvious question uh, before I let you go, Randy. Um, so do you, do you think Bigfoot's real? Have you ever seen him? I have never seen him myself, but I will tell you this, that right after that program, when I ran home, I ran in the house, my uncle was visiting and my dad was sitting at the kitchen table. They, uh, my, my grandfather settled Iron Creek in Troy, Montana back in 1913. They had a homestead up there with 400 acres of farmland, a beautiful country. And my dad said, you know, we were just sitting here talking about it. And he says, when we were little kids going down Iron Creek, we remember uh, coming upon a bank that was muddy. And there was a huge, like something had stepped on the bank and the bank collapsed, leaving a giant footprint. He says, at the time, we just thought that is the biggest grizzly bear we'd ever, we would ever want to encounter. And we turned and ran home. He says, looking back at it, we're just talking about it. He says, I'm wondering, you know, <laughs> if it wasn't something else. Now, I have never seen anything myself, but the next time I talk to you, I'll tell you a story about a guy I worked with up here who was a uh, renowned tracker, uh, retired state trooper. He told us a good story um, about himself and what he does now. But uh, anyway, I'll I'll let you go. But uh, anyway, I just want to say I just love your show, man. I mean, it is... Uh, it keeps me going up here when I'm on patrol at night, and I appreciate it. Well, you know, the funny thing is, oh, before I let you go, which uh, book do you want? Do you want the, uh, and this is going to be autographed by Dr. Meldrum, by the way. Uh, do you want the Sasquatch Legend, or do you want the Field Manual? Oh, give me the Legend, please. There Thank you me. go. Um, that's it. I just put Randy Cole right here. Um, yeah, see, the thing is about this show Randy and and I and I'm glad that I hear you say that and and uh all of the email has been great and everything but I need I need everybody to understand one thing um and certainly you know while we're waiting for Art's return I'm waiting for Art Bell to come back okay <laughs> I need everybody to understand I love his show but in the meantime you know what what is it that uh, that I could do for everybody out there, for all of those Art Bell fans. And it's not imitate art. It's not about that. It's about doing a show that I found is interesting and, and as compelling as what art did and does. And so this is a show that um, I did uh, when I was doing sports. It was the same type of show. It wasn't any different. Just the subject matter was different. But my approach to radio has always been the same, and that is don't hold back, have fun, and keep it interesting. And, and if, I, if I can do that, then you will find it interesting the way that I find radio interesting because I grew up listening to AM radio like all of us did, and we all loved it. And, and so for you to say that, that just lets me know that I'm on target and that everybody out there is happy, and and that's and that's the goal of this show. So I really do appreciate it. Oh, you nailed it! <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're doing a great job. I just can't think of. Uh, yeah, that's great. It's, it's awesome. Just keep it up. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I've just got the signal. I got two minutes left. So Randy, stay safe up there in Alaska with whatever you're doing. And, uh, and as you know, uh, the phone line is always open for you. Uh, don't be a stranger and. And all the best to you, okay? All right, sir. Thank you, Jimmy. Bye-bye. You got it. I'll talk to you, Randy. Bye-bye. Bye. And that's what I'm talking about. That is truly why I do this show. And it means more to me. I just want to know that everybody out there is as happy as I am. And, and if it's as interesting to me, then it's interesting to you. And that's, that's why this show was done. Now, don't forget... Uh, keep the emails coming. I'm going to jump into the forums after the show tonight. I've seen all the posts that have uh, come in. Oh, I didn't get to email. We'll do that tomorrow night. And tomorrow night, by the way, Antonio Paris is going to be in here. Now, Now, Antonio, we're going to do uh, probably a full three hours tomorrow night with Antonio. 
but we're going to do the current state of ufology and research tomorrow night. He has got it going on out there with his organization in Florida and his method of research. And I am totally, totally impressed with his professionalism and his background. And if you if you don't know who Antonio is, you've got to come in and listen to, uh, tomorrow night. As I always promise, only the best, only the most interesting, the most compelling, the most cosmopolitan and international thinkers. And you know what? Antonio Paris is all of that. I want to say special thanks to Keith Rowland. Fade to Black is produced by executive Rita Kamurian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm. Announcers are Steve Harder and Mark Kovar. Associate producer, Mark Kovar. Guitars by Doug Aldrich. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Produced by KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network. I am out of here. We'll see you tomorrow night. Have a good night, everybody. Wow, 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 wow,